Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the City of Delray Beach's regular commission meeting scheduled for Tuesday, October 11th at, on 2022 at 4 p.m. Please call the roll. Mr. Frankel. Present. Ms. Cassell. Here. Mr. Bolston. Present. Ms. Johnson. Present. Mayor Petrolia. And I am here. Um, for those that can, please stand for the pledge. Whoops. Okay, we are at agenda uh, approval. Do we have any additions or substitutions, deletions, changes? None? Oh, you do? No. Okay, please. Okay. It's 6C, I believe. 6C. That's a landscape maintenance agreement. Is that the one you're looking no, for? No, they must have no. changed it. Um, okay. 6L, 6.L.1. Okay, 6L.1. And. Uh, uh, there's no K, there's no L. Okay. So let's 6K maybe, dot one. I didn't get a fresh one. It's. Um, Those are proclamations. Uh, it's the awards and bids. Okay. Did they take, take it off? Did I go there? Did I not go? No. One specific. Is it the uh, one for the um, old school square? I believe so. Hold on a second. Six K one. Is six K one? Correct. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The bid waiver. Yeah. Okay, that's the one you want to bring off. A bid waiver. Yes. Okay, so, so make that seven A A with the approval the of everyone. Yes. Is six. Sorry for the confusion. It was 6E. Okay, that C. is um, dedication, uh, a right-of-way dedica dedication? Uh, Palm Beach Waste. No, that's, that's, uh, six, that's e 6 as in David. D. Okay. Okay. To... 7BB. Double check it. Thank you. Anything else? Ma Mayor, I just yes. had a question. Did sure. you did you have something special pre-meeting for 6I5 uh, for a birdie May Holton? If not, I feel like that should be. Do we have what now? The uh, the for Miss. We're going to be reading the proclamation. You are. You yes, are we are okay. absolutely. Okay. We're going to read. The, we're going to do that first. Okay. I'm sorry. We should have changed that as well. So thank you for bringing that to my attention. So we're going to bring that up um, to be one, the first presentation. Great. And then we'll um, move on to presentations after that. So we're going to move that in. So four AA. Yep, four AA. Any anything else? All. No? Okay. Entertain a motion as amended. Motion to approve the agenda as amended. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolson. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Okay. All right. So moving on, we are at presentations and we have a very, very special lady in the audience. And um, her name is Miss Birdie May Holton. And uh, I just want to say welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And um, a very happy birthday to you, um, 103. So I'm going to read the proclamation into the record here. And then if you would like, um, you're welcome to come up as a group or just individually. And you can stand in front of all of us and we can take a picture of you again. I know that it, we did the mayor's picture earlier, but it's completely up to you if you want an additional picture with the commission behind. So here's the proclamation. Whereas Miss Bertie May Holton was born in Rhine, Georgia on October 20, 1919. And whereas Miss Bertie May Holton was married to the late Mr. Al Holton for 50 years. And whereas Mr. and Mrs. Holton were blessed to have three sons, two of which have unfortunately pre-deceased, deceased her in death, and one remaining who re resides in the Bronx, New York. And whereas, whereas the Holton family moved to Delray Beach in the 1950s, and Miss Bertie May Holton has called the three-time All-American City her home for over 70 years. Whereas Miss Bertie Holton is a member of the St. Paul Missionary Baptist Church of Delray Beach, and whereas Miss Bert Bertie Holton enjoys listening to spiritual songs as well as music by Riley B. King, better known as B.B. King, <laughs> and whereas Miss Holton enjoys gardening, cooking, and baking, where some of her favorite things to cook were pork chops, <laughs> baking sweet potato pies, 
and baking homemade cakes. And whereas on October 20, 2022, Miss Bertie Mae Holton will be honored to celebrate her 103rd birthday. Now therefore I, Shelley Petrolia, Mayor of the City of Delray Beach, on behalf of the City Commission and the citizens of Delray Beach, do hereby wish Miss Bertie Mae Holton a very happy 103rd birthday and further recognize and wish her the best of health and happiness for many more years to come. So I want to invite you to come up if you'd like to take a picture. And um, I'm kind of thinking we should sing a happy birthday. I, uh, do too. I, I, I mean, do. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm certainly feeling it. So it. If, if we can, let's go ahead and, you know, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bertie. Happy birthday to you. It's amazing, Miss Bertie, that you brought half the town with you. <laughs> so we have, a, we have a, a proclamation that I just read in, um, framed out for you. I'm going to give that to you. And if you want, you can come up and take a picture. We can all stand behind. Or if you're good with pictures, you can do whatever you want to do. Absolutely, bring them up. Thank you guys for coming. It's very exciting. Great day. I can't see what. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> All right. This is a good. This is, this is a good representative of who was here for Miss Birdie May. I'm telling you, much better than the last one. All right, so what we're going to do is get your picture and then, then part of the way so they can get other pictures behind you. Yeah, let the Coastal Star get you. Everybody look in the back of the room to the guy in the red shirt. Oh, wait. Three, two, one. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm late, but I'm here. <laughs> I, know, I got to. I have to. Yes, I'm photo bombing. Are you kidding me? I never, I never changed. I never passed that opportunity. It's going to be a long meeting. <laughs> That's why we did it first. They say, uh, they say they can leave. Okay. She can yeah. leave, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I think I say you just, you've earned you've earned your Oh my gosh. Well that would have been out front. They 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 don't they don't come in. We almost made that happen for this day as well. They're right to the dogs that's on for the day, that's what I'm trying to say. I know I don't they didn't come. They didn't come, yeah. So yeah, because we reached out to him to specifically confirm. Exactly. You have to, okay. She needs yes. to get a picture yeah. with her. October 11th. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Young man. Young man. Are you, are you related to? Is that your great grand grandmother? Oh, great, great, great. Yeah. That's amazing. You are really blessed. Oh, you are really great, great grandma. That's amazing. 
you guys enjoy. Keep celebrating. Oh. Okay, so moving on, we're going to our presentation uh, 4A, which is the Palm Beach County bond referendum. And Mr. Moore, I think you have this, and I guess a Mr. Miller. Yes, ma'am. So the city of Delray Beach, as were a number of municipalities throughout Palm Beach County, were contacted to offer a brief presentation relative to the housing bond referendum consideration that will be before the voters throughout Palm Beach County at the upcoming election, November 8th, and Mr. Morris G. Miller is here to offer a brief presentation to provide background and information for everyone's benefit and update. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Th thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Good to see everyone. Is, is this my? It is. OK, great. So this is going to be on the ballot in November. It's county question number one, housing bond. Um, and the reason that we have this is in January of 2021, Florida International University released a Palm Beach County housing needs assessment, which documented the severe housing crisis in Palm Beach County and showed a net deficit of 20,000 units for essential workers between 2010 and 2019. This shortage has been getting worse over a period of many years. Since 2012, we have built about 2,000 units each year less than what we needed to keep up with demand. That means we are now about 20,000 units short of where we really need to be to accommodate the housing needs for our essential workers. Uh, I'm not going to read this. This is the language that's going to be on the ballot. You'll all get your sample ballot in the mail. But I will explain what it really says. It's, we're asking the voters to approve a bond issue to increase the supply of affordable and workforce housing. The bonds will be repaid from ad valorem taxes levied on all taxable property in the county. The amount that the county can issue is up to $200 million, and it can provide funding subsidy for households earning up to 140% of area median income, which is $128,000. So this will be available to households earning anywhere from zero per year to $128,000 per year. Okay, so this is how the bonds will translate into units. The bond issue will encourage developers to build housing with units for households making up to 140% of area median income. The proceeds of the bonds will be used to offer low interest rate loans to builders who will produce homes and apartments that are affordable to our essential workers. It will be paired with other sources such as private loans, fee waivers, and other federal, state, and local programs. If you are a renter, the benefits of this program are obvious. If you are a homeowner, the benefits to you are significant as well. I'm sure you've all seen help wanted signs and signs on restaurants and businesses that are closed. The reason they're closed is because they can't find workers, and the reason they can't find workers is because the workers cannot afford to live in Palm Beach County. A study by the Tourist Development Council showed that low wages and high, and high housing costs were the primary reasons why workers leave retail and service jobs. You see this everywhere. You go into a restaurant and you see that a whole section is empty because they don't have servers. The pharmacy that used to be open seven days a week is now only open six days a week and it closes at five o'clock in the afternoon. Children are going to school and half the time they have a substitute teacher. These all are reflecting back to the fact that the cost to live in Palm Beach County is just so high, higher than most other places in the country. If these shortages continue, they will affect the ability of law enforcement, hospitals, and fire and rescue departments to be adequately staffed, which will make our communities less safe and, in, and may result in increased response times and possibly higher property insurance rates. Also, if households are spending too much of their income on housing, they may not have enough money for other necessities like health care, and they won't have disposable income, which means less business for our local stores and restaurants. And many of you who thought you were going to be empty nesters have to deal with your adult children moving back home because they cannot afford the cost of housing. We share this problem with the rest of South Florida. This is the problem that we are trying to address. We want people to be able to afford to live here so they can work here. Putting money towards the problem is not the whole answer, but in this situation it will be an important step in addressing the severe supply-demand imbalance. We must add units, and we want those units to be affordable to those performing essential jobs, those people who make our community a great place to live.
To give you an example, if the county makes a $2 million loan from bond proceeds to a multifamily developer, and that represents about 10% of the total cost of the development, for that $2 million, we are actually going to get $20 million of construction activity. This huge multiplier will bring a large benefit to help the economy, in addition to what it's going to do to moderate housing prices. There are two primary benefits to this program on the rental side. The first benefit, it will moderate rates throughout Palm Beach County because as we add supply, we should be able to reduce the prices. The second benefit will be for those who are lucky enough to get a unit that is rent restricted. Those households will see an immediate decrease in their housing cost. On the single family side, this will enable builders to build housing at a much more moderate cost than most of the product that's out there today. We think that on the single family side, we will see a moderation in house prices and we will see houses become more affordable again to people who qualify for the program. Here are just two examples of essential workers who are priced out. We are using for purposes of these examples the standard benchmark of 3 and 30, which means that people can generally afford to buy a house that costs three times their annual income and people can generally afford to pay 30% of their total income for rent. Our first example is of the average Palm Beach County teacher salary of $51,400, which means they can afford a house costing $155,000. Well, homes at this price do not exist in Palm Beach County. Our average house price right, right now is close to $550,000. The average teacher cannot even afford our average rent. Our second example is a Palm Beach County sales clerk making $18 per hour, which means they can afford a rent of about $910 per month. But our average rent is at least $1,700 a month and probably more. So this average person is only making half of what they truly need to afford to live in Palm Beach County. This is how the bond issue is going to work. Bond proceeds will be used to provide low interest rate subordinate gap financing that replaces more expensive debt and equity required to build units. In return for the less expensive funding, a substantial percentage of the units being built will be sold or rented to qualified households for a below market sales price or rent for an extended period of time, somewhere between 20 and 50 years. Here's the way this is going to work. Let's say the bond issue is providing 10% of the cost, and let's say that's $2 million towards a $20 million development. On the multifamily side, by providing the developer that low interest rate financing, for example, at 2% a year, instead of equity, which might cost 12 to 20% a year, the developer will save hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest cost every year. And the way these loans will be structured, this debt will be subordinate, which means it will make it easier for them to go out and get senior debt because the senior debt will get repaid first. Not-for-profit or smaller developers that do not have deep pockets may not be able to finance their development at all without this subordinate gap financing. In exchange for the money that the developer is going to save, they will have to agree to set aside a per certain percentage of their units for affordable and workforce housing. How much they set aside and what income category the set-aside units will be provided to will depend on how each developer submits their application for funding to the county. The county will not tell developers what to do. Rather, the county will offer incentives to developers that will provide a greater per unit subsidy to lower the income level that is targeted. On the single family side, the money will be used to provide a loan to the developer that is equal to the difference between the cost for the developer to build a house or condominium and the sales price that the developer can get. When the unit is completed and ready to be sold, the county, the state, and other funders will provide additional funding sources to make up that gap to the developer. In essence, on the single family side, it will be like a revolving loan fund. As the house is sold to the end buyer, the loan to the developer is repaid and the funds will be available to make another loan even after the bond money is all spent. On the multifamily side, because the loan is to be repaid over time, the bond money will go out and then in a few years it will start coming back in as the loan starts to be repaid and again will be available to make new loans. County staff is developing a bond allocation process to be considered and approved by the county commission. There will be separate competitive processes for single family and multifamily developments that will establish the criteria by which the county will evaluate and rate requests for bond funding. We want to make sure that everyone understands that the bond issue does not impact the zoning and land use approval process for residential units. The county and the cities will still need to go through whatever land use and zoning process they have to go through today to approve the units. If a development is in the unincorporated area, it will have to be approved by the county. If a development is in a city, it will have to be approved by that city. We are not bypassing the normal approval process. 
The bond issue is a major component of the Palm Beach County Housing Plan, Housing for All. One of the action items of the housing plan asks the county and municipalities to put measures in place to make permitting go more quickly, which again will reduce the cost. Almost done. Although theoretically these developments could go anywhere in the county, ideal locations are going to be on major thoroughfares near employment centers that can handle additional density. Developments will be near what we call transit-oriented development, which will be near tri-rail and bright line stations and major bus lines, which will reduce the cost of units in those areas because people will be less likely to need cars, so parking requirements will be less, and those types of areas will be more suited for additional density. There are also areas that provide opportunities for what we call adaptive reuse. Adaptive reuse is where you take, for example, a vacant shopping center or another underutilized commercial use and convert it to multifamily residential. We also think that the bond issue will provide an opportunity for housing in the glades where it's very much needed and so much of the housing is substandard. Keep going. Great. Thank you because this is actually the most important part. How much is it going to cost? As we've said before, it's an ad valorem bond issue, which means that it will be paid for by a separate levy of ad valorem taxes that will go on everyone's tax bill, everyone, not just the unincorporated area, but property in the cities as well. The county has calculated that the additional annual cost will be $4.36 per $100,000 of assessed value. For what the county has determined to be the average homeowner, the cost will be about $14 per year. For $14 a year, you are getting essentially $2 billion worth of new housing, much of which will be affordable to essential workers. Bond issue is part of a larger plan, housing plan for all for Palm Beach County. The plan has four focus areas, funding and financing, planning and regulatory reform, neighborhood revitalization, and racial equity. Through the measures that we're hopefully going to accomplish in these four focus areas, we think we can get to the 20,000 units. This slide explains the measures that will be taken to make sure the program is successful and that it accomplishes what it's intended to accomplish. Landowners who participate in the program will be required to annually certify that they meet their legal, ob legal obligations to charge fair and affordable rents. Homeowners with financing under the program will be required to provide the county a notice of sale. This will enable the county to ensure that when an affordable or workforce program house is resold, it will continue to be affordable to the new buyer. All loans, with, all loans made with bond proceeds will be protected by a recorded deed restriction. The Housing Leadership Council will provide oversight and monitor program progress towards our goals. Thank you. And do questions? I have a question. Yes, sure. Hold on just Great. a second. Great. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually have a few. At one point, you commented about what the um, county would not uh, require, and you said income categories county doesn't require but they're giving incentives to try to get the, to the lower category correct Is that correct, correct. The, the why with this such a need for the lower income didn't the county try to calculate in a certain percentage of this money to go for a certain demographic it doesn't make sense because what we see in our city consistently across the board is that even though we're getting the bonuses and we're greatly appreciative, they're at the higher level, so they're really not serving the population that is in, in, in greatest need. And this sounds like you could potentially have that problem as well. Well, the, the county decided that their primary objective was to get as many new units of housing in place as quickly as possible. And so the allocation process that they are going to go through will ask developers to submit proposals. And the proposal will indicate what income level they're targeting and how much subsidy per unit they are going to require. And, and it's kind of obvious that the lower the income category, meaning the lower the rent, the higher the subsidy the developer is going to need. And that, that's going to be up to the county to, to decide you know, what's more important to them you know, getting, you know, 2,000 units into the ground immediately that will serve that upper band, or maybe, you know, providing less units that will serve the lower band. That, that's going to be totally up to the county commission. Okay, and there was one other thing you said that the county would not be controlling. What was the other item? Um, the, well, the land use. Uh, the financing is totally separate from the land use. So a, the county is not going to come in and basically say, 
you have to grant this higher density if yeah. you want bond proceeds. Okay, the, great. The two are not linked together. And two other questions. You mm -hmm. talked about the fair uh, rent. How long will the rent stay at that level? Uh, right now, and, and I, you know, I don't know if this is going to be the case with the bond issue, but I'm, I'm the general counsel for the housing finance. Sorry, I, I just... That's okay. And, and now when we're doing bond issues, the county is telling us that they want the lower rents to stay in place for 50 years. 50, why? Five zero. Five zero. Okay. I'm not saying the bond no. issue will be the same, but that will give you an indication. Okay, great. And then with the that was for the rentals. What Correct. about the sales? Uh, again, that's going to be up to the county. I mean, they're looking at you know as as little as 15 years and as long as 30 years. There's some there's some countervailing arguments for shortening the period for home ownership because you you want you want families as as they as their income increases, you want them to grow out of that house right. so another moderate income family can move in. Great. So last question, if I may. Thank you very much for your time. When we, when this gets presented on the ballot, will this additional information be available or is it always going to be that the county gets the final decision and we're just determining if we want to go out for the ballot? Um, they're working on an allocation process. I doubt it will be in place by the time we have the election. Okay. Well, the Thank ballots you. are already out, so. Pardon? The ballots are out. Right, right, but I think it, nothing's going to change. It, it does not happen. Well, I didn't know if they were going to provide additional information for. for yeah, I, I just they're working on a bond allocation process, which will be open. The public will have the opportunity to comment on that when it comes out. But okay. again, I, I do not think that's going to be in place before the election. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Yeah. To piggyback on Commissioner Cassell's initial concern. AMI is what creates that issue. The AMI continues to grow in Palm Beach County, but is is not an actual reflection of the um, the household incomes of the individuals that you know, we need to provide housing for growing. And so, to base anything on that AMI, um, I think is 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 only leading to those to those issues. It's giving this wide range, and we need to have it far far more narrowed and we're seeing we're seeing it as well with any program with the county is that that AMI continues to grow and it's false it's not it doesn't really reflect yeah. the household well, incomes as I indicated the, the, the count county has stated that their primary objective is to get as many units in the ground as quickly as possible the idea being if you if you increase the supply that should have the effect of moderating the rents and then the families that do get the units that are rent restricted, again, it, it, they, it could be 140 of AMI, it, it could be 100% of AMI, uh, it could be 60% of AMI. That's all going to be up to the way the county develops their allocation procedures. Um, just to piggyback on exactly what, um, when, you're, when you're talking about the You've said it several times. We're trying to get it. The county's trying to get as many units out as quickly as possible. Are we talking about affordable units? Or are we talking about units in general? The way the bond issue will work is is the developer will submit a proposal, and a percentage of the units will have to be either affordable or workforce. Right. And so my question is on this, and so you're saying that just general, because there's going to be a percentage of those units are going to be affordable if they're going to be, you know, participating. Yes. Um, you haven't given us that percentage, and I know what you said. You said that that hasn't been determined. It depends on how, ma how many lower versus, you know, upper uh, level uh, workforce housing that they get. I'm, I'm just questioning how can... Uh, a voter be, you know, able to say yes to this if, in fact, we don't even know what percentage of affordable homes are coming out from this. The, the bond proceeds will only be used for the affordable and workforce part of a development. So if you vote for the bond issue, you are not going to be voting gotcha. for a developer building market rate units. That, okay. That, those units will not be funded by the program. Okay. Correct. So only those those units that basically right. are so, going to so, be gotcha. So let's say you've got a 100-unit apartment complex, mm -hmm. and the developer agrees to set aside 30 of the units. Mm -hmm. um, the bond proceeds would go to, to offset 30. the cost of those 30 units and not the 70 market rate units. I got gotcha. you. Okay, very good. And but then, I would have been much more comfortable with this if they had select categories 
mm-hmm. and a percentage amount of what's going to the category. Because what you can f- foresee happening is you're going to have all at the high end and you're not going to satisfy the, the, the serious need that's out there for people at the lower end. That's the need mm-hmm. that we're well, struggling with right I now. Mean, I, I mean, the, the way to make that not happen is to make sure that when that proposed allocation process comes out, that people get involved and, and make their opinions known about that. Because that that's that allocation process is going to determine which which bands the money gets spent in. That should probably have happened prior to. I agree. This. No. Well, I, I think that what I agree with my colleagues as well because I know this is a tough position for you to be in because you're you're here you know telling us about this, but I think that a lot of people would be questioning. Well, we're allowing we're 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 agreeing to this without really the knowledge of what is really going to take care of the issues in in our so so what i would say is the worst case from your standpoint Mm -hmm. is that all the units go to people making 140 percent of area median income and does that put us in a better place than we are now or not i mean again that and that would be the absolute very worst case. Mm-hmm. Let me uh, yes. just one more follow-up question. Are they going to freeze that that AMI, or that AMI continues to that number continues to grow, or is it the AMI today when this passes? Uh, I know the answer. I, yeah. Okay, I don't. So <laughs> it, it continues. It continues because continues be, to because grow and it's the ballot grow. the ballot question says 140 percent of area median income. Right. So, so that's going to continue to grow, it, which is not a reflection of any household incomes of these, indiv- you know, the, the, the families. And I, I, look, I, I, you, okay. you guys, you have expressed a serious concern, <laughs> no. and, I'll, and I'm going to say something that I, I'll probably get in a lot of trouble for. But one of the drivers of this has been the concern that we are not able to attract new businesses because they sure. cannot, af- their workers cannot yeah. afford to live here. Absolutely. And, and in that instance, we're not talking about teachers and sales mm-hmm. clerks, you know, we're talking yeah. about engineers right. and, you know, investment bankers. And, you know, we're, we're talking about people making a good income and they don't want to move here because they cannot afford to live here. So that, that's one of the things that's driving this. Yeah. Understood. Thank you for your time. Anyone else? You're you're quite welcome. Um, I know the mayor knows how to reach me, and if if you need, if you want to have any follow-up questions, just let let her know, and she'll track me down, I'm sure. Mr. Miller, thank you so much, and we appreciate your coming here and giving us this information. It's very, very important. I'm hoping that a lot of people in the city are listening in. Thank thank you you for the opportunity. And and I know that it was a last-minute deal trying to get you here before, uh, I, I know that this was something that, I think it was uh, Commissioner Bernard was kind of put this together, so it was it was nice to have you come out on such short notice. So Happy to do it. Thank you. For thank you. Thank All you. right, very good. Moving on to comments and inquiries on agenda and non-agenda items, Mr. Moore. Yes, ma'am. So briefly, clarification regarding the Solar United Neighbors Cooperative Program for Palm Beach. A couple of you all individually had expressed some concern or question relative to this particular initiative. And it actually goes back to the year 2020 in which the city of Delray Beach began some level of involvement. And my interest today is to simply clarify what the program is about specifically so that we can be mindful whenever such requests are made of the city prospectively. So with that, I've asked Sustainability Officer Ken Edwards to please be here to offer a couple words in terms of the background and what this is all about, non-commitments for the city of Delray Beach as a result as well. Ms. Edwards. Thank you very much, um, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Deputy Vice Mayor, and Commissioners. I'm Ken Edwards, Sustainability Officer for the City of Delray Beach, and I have a brief presentation on Solar United Neighbors uh, Solar Co-op Program. First of all, um, participation in this program is consistent with city goals. Uh, CSR 521 generally um, indicates promotion of alternative energy. Um, 5.2.4 5.2.4 specifically encourages reduction of barriers and solar co-ops uh, along that line. Um, also, participation in the solar co-op will lead to more installation of alternative energy, and that can help us with progress towards the Race to Zero initiatives by redu- reducing carbon emissions. So United Neighbors is a nonprofit. They were created in 2007. Their whole mission is to assist the community, both small businesses and individual owners, with installation of, uh, of solar power. They provide a tremendous amount of technical background information and, and education. 
um, background in the co-op uh, since 2015. They've helped with 68 different co-ops, including multiple in Palm Beach County. Uh, they ask for local organizations and muni municipalities to partner, which simply is advertising um, uh, to the community. Uh, Delray Beach was a partner in the 2018 and 2021, and we're looking to participate as a partner in 2022. It's open right now. Um, the solar co-op really is to uh, help people through the, the process. I installed solar on, on my home uh, without a co-op, and I learned a lot. Um, it would have been very helpful to have uh, a very knowledgeable third party uh, assist with that. Um, so they help with the process in selection. They also uh, negotiate for reduced price uh, and buying in bulk can, can definitely be helpful. Other partners include City of Boca Raton and Boynton Beach and, and other local Palm Beach. Uh, so participation uh, in the co-op is for small businesses and, and individuals. They fill out a form online. Uh, the first step is an analysis of the home. Every building is not going to be a good candidate, so they, they screen for that. When there's 50 to 100 uh, participants, they will close, and uh, Sun will help with the RFP process. They're facilitating there. Um, it is the members that actually select the, the vendor, and then um, once selected, it is the individual members that will uh, either sign an agreement or decide not to participate further. There is no obligation in joining the, the co-op uh, uh, to go forward. So in, in conclusion, Sun only receives money when someone joins their organization or if someone who participates in the co-op actually signs an agreement. Uh, and then there's a $600 referral fee, which for the technical assistance is, is uh, reasonable. Membership in Sun is not necessary in order to participate in, in the co-op. Um, partnering um, in the co-op for the city comes at, at no cost uh, to us. And uh, there is a link to additional information uh, to Sun and their co-op and, and general background. And with that, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Very good. To the commission. Any I questions? have questions. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I was the one who was a little taken aback when I read uh, this on our um, postmaster and my first impression was what is this I'd never had it come before us so my question to you mr. Edwards is was this initiative partnership approved by the City Commission um, at for 2022 I did not uh, bring it before um, back in 2021 I did uh, communicate with Jennifer Alvarez, the interim city manager, and got approval at, at that time. So, but never at the city commission level. So, in, it was my opinion that I thought that policy was created by the city commission. So, here we are as a city being partnered or whatever with some initiative and group that we know nothing about. It was not passed by our city attorney. I look at this as, although it's something we love to see happen, as a city, we cannot participate in this kind of operation because should something happen down the road, we as a sponsor could possibly be uh, involved in some legal matter. So again, it did not go by through our attorney. I missed it in 2021. I apologize because I would have voted no not to do this so I think it's something we should all consider I'd like to hear from the city attorney um, so no I I wasn't made aware of it until the postmaster went out you know I think we have to be careful as a city endorsing a business in in the manner that um, is being suggested I know um, in the past I, I and I tried to look I don't know if it's a policy that we have or it's in our purchasing code but typically, you know, we don't um, endorse businesses to residents. Um, we've been asked, I've been asked by public works and utilities on other occasions, you know, if we can put something in the, in the utility bill, you know, endorsing a certain business for, you know, uh, maintenance of the water lines or something like that. And, you know, the answer is always no, because as a city to endorse a private business, 
Now, it's it's not the best practice, in my opinion, and I think are we, you are we endorsing this business? Is that what we're doing here? Well, in a sense, we're we're encouraging members of the public to join into this co-op. You know, we're presenting the information. You know, it's one thing if we encourage our residents to you know put up solar panels and and express how in our comp plan that's in there, but to you know to promote a certain co-op, I think we have to be careful. Well, you know, it's interesting that you bring this up, uh, Commissioner Johnson, because I had the same question and concern when I was speaking with uh, Mr. Moore about this when during the agenda review. I felt like it would have been easier to have a list of different, um, exactly. uh, you know, businesses that were, I don't know if I'm creating that, but anyway, um, a, a list so that we're not necessarily just pointing out to one um, you know, different co-ops, that sort of thing, to in order to be able to alleviate ourselves from any kind of liability going down the road. Because again, I with I'm with you. I don't know if anybody watched 60 Minutes this weekend, but there was a there was a small town in uh, the West Coast close to the water that survived like almost unscathed. A couple of trees down, electric continuing to go. It's a sustainable. Um, it, they built it sustainably, higher and stronger and 100% solar. It's the only 100%, I think, solar city in the state of Florida. And um, I think it was called Babcock or something to that effect, Ranch. And I'm telling you, it was, it was an amazing thing. So I think that we need to really be thinking about this and moving in that direction. I want to do that. Um, I want my town to do that. But again, I think that it's, uh, it, it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable with one group and kind of like uh, tagging on to that. So. I would tell you if there's a group of different ones that we can put out there in order to be able to push forward, that's the way I would do it. I don't think that I feel comfortable just picking out one and then uh, sponsoring it, so to speak. So Anyone else? Yeah. So is, I'm sorry. Is this, the, is this the group that has a program with FPL? No. No. This is just a 501c3. They are nonprofit. Their whole mission is to assist individuals and businesses that want to go solar. But we have no promise or guarantee that there is not the desire for this nonprofit to maybe partner with someone. I don't know that the members are the ones choosing the solar. It, it, it is the they members they are. that select. Okay. I still am very uncomfortable with us promoting any one particular nonprofit over another nonprofit. What if two or three other nonprofits said, okay, come and endorse. We're not in the business to promote nonprofits and whatever. It's a great thing to promote the solar energy theory. It's another thing to form a partnership with anyone to have it be Could promoted. I just ask, though, for clarification, forgive me. What exactly, when they come, do they give the, they're the nonprofit giving advice. Are they doing the installs and all that themselves, or are they directing them out to other people? Uh, it, they are facilitating a selection process. Okay, so they help with the selection process and give guidance. Right, but it is the members that do the, the selecting. Um, they write an RFP and, you know, organize the, the meetings where, where the members do the selection. And then it's individual members that will sign an agreement with the vendor that's selected, and they aren't involved in that process at all. Thank you. Are there other companies that do the same thing and other nonprofits do the same thing as the Sun Group? I, I have not heard of, of them. I mean, there may be, and there certainly are interests um, for alternative energy, but I haven't heard of one that actually helps people in a buying co-op. I think I'd be more I could be in favor of this, but I I would need a pres presentation. Like why you know why isn't this group coming why, in? Why did we pick this group? And I can service, almost I guarantee exactly you, I would almost guarantee you that there are others out there. And for us to be picking winners and losers, I'm just totally against it. I I, I don't want to see the city entangled in anything that's untowards. We don't know what's down the pike with this. If some company gets picked and they're not happy with it, they can say, well, I didn't get into the co-op. If it ha I wouldn't have gotten into the co-op if it hadn't been for the city of Delray Beach right. sponsoring it. So I can see, I'm always looking for the legal down the road yeah. problems. And I Disagree. think we don't always look before we leap. I agree. I don't disagree either, but I have to tell you, I've had people come to my door a million times. I would love to go solar, but I know nothing about it, and I have no time to really investigate the process, find a good um, company. So 
I maybe we just on our own try to make a list, as you said, of, of reliable local businesses. I don't know, but it would be nice to have the residents have a resource that they can go to, but I don't disagree. This could be problematic. Deputy Vice Mayor, I would even uh, caution against that because if there is any company on a list that's sponsored by the city, you are now in partnership with that company for any liability that's down the road. Well, I'm not we are not in the, in the business of picking winners and losers. How about the Green Board having making recommendations? Is that possible? Does that kind of remove it from the city if they were to like mm -hmm. have a list of different names doing something? In I think the list is, is a good yeah. alternative. Okay. And especially, you know, Mr. Edwards is a subject matter expert. The Green Board is subject mm -hmm. matter experts. If they were to compile a list, and obviously we would put a disclaimer at yeah, the end he, he that you know it. we're not endorsing any of these, right. but mm -hmm. it's a resource for the residents. I'd be they, up for that for I, sure. I would not have an I issue. I would use it. Thank yeah. you. I yes, think I, I, if we can make I, it go in that direction, I think you've got consensus. Okay. So that means we're going to remove ourselves from this co-op and sponsorship, et cetera, Correct. et cetera. We're make a, just a, um, a list like. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. All right. So anything else, Mr. Moore? Briefly, I have one other item. And this is in response to a, an inquiry raised by Vice Mayor Adam Franco during the last meeting, Monday, September 19th, mm -hmm. having to do with the standards for school safety signage. Yep. I actually incorporated an information letter report on the subject via the September 30th piece. So given the fact that you brought it up publicly, during a meeting September 19th, I thought I'd offer a few words here. Sure. Publicly in that regard. I'm sorry, sir. Made me oh, <laughs> please forgive me. <laughs> so in any event, as I discussed in the information letter report of September 30th, 38 new safety signs to be installed in nine com schools in the city of Derry Beach corporate limits that is forthcoming. Florida Department of Transportation collaborating with the city of Derry Beach to get to that place. We are essentially positioning a crew from the Department of Public Works to work collaboratively with the Florida Department of Transportation to get those installed immediately. No specific concrete date has yet been set, but we look forward to getting that available to everyone soon because, again, this goes back to 2021, right before my arrival, in which some commitments were made to that effect. And so we are now finally experiencing some momentum. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are. I yield at this time. Okay, well, I, I would have to tell you, I know that there was a woman here, I think two meetings ago, that was very upset yes, about the ones that are on um, Lake Ida Road. So yes, maybe that would be the place to start. But thank you very much. That's great to be moving forward. Spady. Was it Spady? Yes. Spady, that's correct. Yeah, on Lake Ida Road. That's, that's right. correct. Right, yes, absolutely. Okay, so moving on, we are now at the public comment uh, portion of the meeting. So the meeting is now open to public comment for anybody who would like to speak to any topic on the agenda. I, without that is not a quasi-judicial item or a public hearing item. You'll have three minutes to speak. St state your name and address. Yvonne and Odom, 3905 Lawson Boulevard. Hi, everybody. Hello. I'm speaking on that bond issue. This gentleman presented this to our elders meeting, and I said that to them, and I'm saying it publicly, that I believe moving forward we need to do more individual with individual people. We talk about developers, 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 but don't assist individuals to get their own little piece of property. And I think moving forward, that's something we should look at. I am the president of Derry Beach CDC. We've been here for since 1992. And 90% of our homeowners still have their home. They don't buy a home to sell it. And that's a misnomer. And for us to do a bond issue, and the most words I hear say developer, giving the developer the sentence or rent. Why not Yvonne Odom and Eddie Odom want to buy a house, give me the incentive. And I just think that's what we should do moving forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, Montre Bennett, 323 Northwest 2nd Avenue in the beautiful city of Derry Beach. Um, I just want to say we have to heal together in this beautiful city. Uh, we really got to start the division on all sides and be one day array. Um, and after we heal, we really need to start working together and not working for downtown, but working for all of the array. Um, born and raised 87 
same house that I live in today, a lot of people in my neighborhood are not there no more. Uh, but we have to find ways to keep people in their homes and stop trying to find ways to get people out of their homes. Um, just like that housing bond, we got to do better at helping people fix their homes. We have the money to do it, and it shouldn't be so difficult to obtain it. Help people get them, help people stay in their homes so they don't have to be forced to sell their homes. Um, and let's get back to old day, Ray, because when I was growing up, the city was very much alive and well and very active in the set neighborhood. Um, I remember hooping up on Atlanta Avenue. We had stuff every weekend. The city was together. The city gave from the kindness of their heart. They ain't thinking about, oh, just because it's this amount of dollars. They ain't thinking about that. They thought about doing what was right for the people. And, and y'all got to do what's right for the people, not just for yourself. Uh, I thank you, Ryan, Shirley, Shelley, Adam, Julie Casale, Terrence Moore, and Lynn for what you are doing, but you can do better. Uh, it's not just about downtown. Again, it's dark past. It's dark when you come across Winton. We need more lighting. We want more signage. We want to be. We want the light to be shined on us too. We were sitting before Pineapple Grove. So let us do what we need to do in our neighborhood, in our city, and give us our $94 million and let us do what we need to do. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, Marjorie Ferrer with the Daughters of the American Revolution. I told you I would be back with your certificate. Uh, we chatted about the um, project for the graduating class of 2026 who are currently in ninth grade. Um, and thanks to your city manager and Janet Meeks, who I realize has retired, all 530 of your ninth graders have their book. Great. It was delivered. Um, I've personally delivered 10,000 books. Um, still got 4,000 to go. But I wanted to read to you the, the label that we said we put inside the book, um, celebrating America's 250th birthday. My name is, and they're going to have to put their name in it, and I am among an amazing group of students who will be in the graduating class of 2026 when, Amer excuse me, when America celebrates its 250-year birthday. During the next four years as a high school student, I will have opportunities to earn points by participating in contests organized by the sc school district for each grade, 9, 10, 11, and 12. If I qualify to travel to Washington, D.C. in my senior year, we're going to take a group of kids, Mm. Uh, I must keep this Constitution book, which would be my passport. Mm -hmm. If they lose the book, they can't go. Congratulations on being a part of this exceptional group of students to learn about our Constitution and the history of America. So I have books for you all because you can't read it too many times. <laughs> and I have a flag for you. And I'd like to read, uh, this is from the Daughters of the American Revolution. Outstanding Community Award, excuse me, <coughs> presented to the city of Delray Beach for participation in the Palm Beach School District and Daughters of the American Revolution, America 250 project for students graduating in 2026, celebrating America's 250th birthday. Signed by myself and our state regent, Deborah Duway. So congratulations. I will be back. We've got four years, but we want to make sure all these 530 students graduate, that they're smart, they learn to vote, they learn the rule of law, and they probably will come to these meetings if what if I lose my, if I lose my book I can't go <laughs> if you lose your book you can't go and you're not in ninth grade you qualify <laughs> thank you all very much thank you, and a lot of thank this, you so much for what you're doing oh, thank you a lot absolutely. of the cities that I'm working with all the cities in Palm Beach County uh, are asking what they can do because we're finding that a lot of the um, citizens have no idea if you ask anybody What's the importance of the year 2026? Yeah, no one know. knows. There you go. Um, because it's still four years away. So a lot of cities are doing a little thing on their website to just start educating uh, their citizens. They're getting uh, doing more for July 4th, which is when the Constitution was signed, and um, Veterans Day and all Constitution Week. So just kind of 
stepping it up, and that's okay. what I think a lot of the cities are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just saw our um, PIO officer back there uh, marking something down. I'm hoping that's what it was. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very good. So Gina's on it. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. You got it. Hello there. Hello, everyone. Uh, Vera Woodson, 1885 Palm Cove Boulevard, City of Delray Beach. Um, I wore pink today because I'm tickled pink. All right. Okay. I am. Um, back in June, I uh, attended a, a, a community organization meeting um, in the set, and uh, they were speaking about the Libby Wesley Amphitheater mm -hmm. and how shameful it was that it was not holding up to the standards that they believe would honor one of our citizens that it was named after. And so I took it upon myself to go home and craft this plan. And I called up or actually text, or I don't know how I got in contact with you, Mr. Moore. I mean, really, I, I think we saw each other at the, what was it, 4th of July, something or no, Christmas tree lighting. That's when we saw each other. Um, but after that, uh, I sat down and typed up a lot of the things that I see downtown that needed to be fixed, refurbished, refreshed, what have you. And I presented that list to you all. Um, while I was putting that list together, I happened to bump into um, Commissioner Johnson who said, if you do anything, anything, you get that rust fixed on Libby. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me, Vera? And I'm like, okay, I will get the rust fixed. Well, I'm proud to report the rust is fixed. Very good. Um, it, was, it was a wonderful experience through this with Mr. Moore and his team of professionals. Um, we had our 90-day uh, accountability meeting on the 6th of October. We did a walkthrough of Libby with all of the remaining items that will be taken care of for the refresh. Mm -hmm. I went to Old School Square at 8 o'clock in the morning to see that they had already fixed all the electrical outlets and put these new shiny, they look like new nickels, um, on the um, post in the Logia area. They have worked to put flowers on the West End to make it beautiful, and they have dedicated a lot of time, energy, effort, and resources, and I praise your team and your leadership for that. I also wanted to let you know that I uh, actually, I. Uh, adopted a classroom at Carver Middle School. It's the music classroom run by um, the teacher, uh, Brandy Edwards. And uh, when I told her what I'd like to, to see, she said, oh my gosh, if there's anything we can do, along with her assistant principal, to be in downtown and perform, we would love that. So I told Mr. Moore, I said, hey, if we get this all refreshed by December 3rd, I can have the students come and sing carols on the Ave for Christmas. Now, of course, now I'm their agent, I'm their manager for the team, <laughs> for the band, okay, so for the, the little chorus. Um, and so we're looking forward to that, and hopefully the parents will also come downtown and bring those new um, visitors to our area if they've never been before. Um, I, I'm very proud of what has happened because I know in a lot of cities you hear a lot of complaints. People walk up to the podium and they just can't handle it. But I want to say thank you very, very much for all of your help, all of you on the dais for the support that you provide you, the Vera. city every day. Thank you. Appreciate that. And like remember, no, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to thank Vera, Vera for all of the hard work and effort that she's done. I tried, but you did it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Got it. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody, major, council members, and everybody. Uh, my name is Clemencia Dobiecki. I live in 1382A High Point Way, mm -hmm. Northeast, Delray Beach, Florida, 33445. Mm -hmm. The reason I'm here is a concern. I just uh, bought a house in 2020, December 2020, and I've been very happy. I was very happy to know the city had uh, different good things for uh, senior citizens. And uh, I said, wow, perfect. When I got, I got the 220 and 221, I got the stickers for parking on the beach on the A1A. And uh, to my concern now, I was kind of, the new parking stickers, I know you pass some ordinance before, and I read the ordinance because I asked Mr. Just to send it to me, he sent it, and I read the ordinance. And uh, the ordinance increased the age from 62 to 70. He says, wow, it's too much. So we younger, senior people, that we have to, you know, 
to wait until we're 70 to try to get the, the new sticker to park in A1A. I know what is the problem in A1A. In these two years I've been living here, it's almost full of people, you know, trying to park at different hours during high season. So, and I said, well, what the solutions we can get? Because I'm not here to put you the, to complain. No, I'm here to ask for solutions too, because I'm the person that goes every, almost every single day. If it's not raining, and I'm in here in town, I go to the beach. I like to go to the north part where the um, catamarans are located. And I like to park my car over there, walk around, talk to people, and that's it. That is probably my social life sometimes after the pandemic. So I believe it is unfair, you know, to increase that age too much. I know you guys have before meetings and uh, uh, I was explained you have meetings and people, you know, that decided to do that. But it's concerned to me and people of my age, I'm 67, and that we cannot we only can park in certain spots that during high season is f completely full. I've been going, you know, going, even though I have before the parking sticker for the A1A, I was going everywhere, you know, trying to find parking, impossible. So I have, I have to propose you several, yeah, have several points. For instance, uh, reduce the age, six, oh, oh. Yeah, that's your three minutes. So um, do you have a bunch of points that you want to make? A uh, few ones. Okay. Um, what you could do is you can send that to us. We understand your concern. And if you'd like to reach out to us, you can do that. And we will respond by email. But we typically don't respond here anyway. I know. So no problem. But I mean, I if there's any one thing you want to mention to us right now, that's fine. And yes, okay. it's uh, like uh, to reduce the age of 66 as the uh, business tax at the office because I have a business with okay. the uh, with the city. So um, would you qualify for that? For what? 66? I'm 67. So, and I was very happy when I was getting my uh, my tax for my business, and it says, oh no, you don't have to pay 100. 90 something dollars it's really good for me so so do me a favor write to each of us you can get our i need all your information i'm sorry it's the first time i come absolutely. here absolutely and this remind me when i was from the from the uh, green energy committee of the town of baby i'm going to have somebody follow you out and get you the addresses or how to get the addresses for you and we're going to continue to do business in here okay oh, yes and and just reach out me? to us and do us a little uh and I, I'd be no. more than happy to help you because as an architect, licensed architect and planner, I can be, uh, you know, master urban and regional planning. I Good. can help you and I can help the city. Call me and I'll be more than happy to All do right. that. All right, thank you so much. And we appreciate you coming in, especially for your first time. Yes. Okay, so if somebody can assist her and can just give help me her to get the, uh, the addresses. Yes. Thank you so much. Oh, okay. No, I mean a, a, a city, a city oh. official. You have a volunteer. A city official. <laughs> I just want to volunteer. Mr. Walthour, if you would please, or Joe is here. There you go. Our new parking Thank administrator. You. Please, so I that'd appreciate be great. that. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else to speak um, during public comments? Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is now closed. We are moving on to the consent agenda. We had a uh, cha couple changes, so as amended. Motion to approve as amended. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay. We have um, the first uh, um, 6K1 uh, was pulled off, I believe, by um, Commissioner Johnson, uh, and that is 7AA, and this is resolution number 160 22. 6KA. 6K1. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. I was just concerned that. Um, we're, I don't want to discuss it because, as we all realize, that there is a lawsuit and anything we say could be held against us. But I'm just very concerned that we're expending this amount of money with, especially since we were told that it's practically done and we're going to spend this amount of money just for, I believe, an architect just to come and review what's already there. Have we not already put this through our planning? Um, development 
agency or group, rather, department. And good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Missy Barletto, Public Works Director. Um, there is an existing set of plans. The construction is not almost done. There's quite a bit left to be done. Um, the existing plan set was developed by the architect that's on the agenda to be approved. And this will shorten the timeline for us to be able to move forward and get the construction completed at the Crest Theater as quickly as possible. So this is just for the architect. Do we have any idea, an estimate, a goal, as to how much expenditure we're going to be expecting to do whatever needs to be done? We've never discussed it, at least I haven't. It's in the budget, but it, we approved. We, yeah, 1.3, I think it was. 1.3. Correct. Okay. So we're right back to what? the donor gave. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do we know what the cost of this these plans were originally? Is this the are we are we paying it for? Is are they double dipping? Or is this a full set of plans that do we know? They are not double dipping. What they're doing is signing over the existing plan set and making the city the owner so that we do not have to go back through the building permit process to mm -hmm. save that amount of time. And um, May I ask, does that, that includes the fees they've pay, paid thus far? So we're getting the plans and we're getting the benefit of the fees that they've paid thus far? The city doesn't charge itself. No, I know, but fees, they've but paid. No, I mean, architect. so. I, the Center for the Arts did pay for, for their building permit fees right. um, before the prior construction project I'm was. I mean, they gave permission for that architect to, because at one point we couldn't get these. That's, that's not required for them to give us permission. So not us, the architect. It's not required okay. for the architect to get their permission to do that. Okay. The plans actually belong to the professional that signs off on them. Okay, great. It doesn't seem right. Um, but I believe when I was reading this, they're doing more than just handing us plans. So for Ms. Johnson's benefit, could you explain what this cost incorporates? So in addition to in handing public, us plans, there were certain pieces of the um, of the renovation that had not yet been designed they will be completing those designs where we were going to vent for the commercial kitchen that's being put in where the vent will go for that that sort of thing had not actually been included in the previous plan set that the city had taken a look at there are several things that that as we have gone through the building and taken a look at it there are some code violations in there that we'll be bringing up to code to make sure that everything is on the up and up. Okay, first of all, I'd like to say we never, we the city, to my knowledge, we never approved a commercial kitchen. Did we not? I don't think we approved any of it. Originally, so that was an issue. Why, so why are we even talking about a commercial kitchen? That might not be something we want to do. I have brought it before commission and asked for consensus on whether yes. you wanted to move forward with that. We did. And the consensus was that that the that What you I was did. saying prior to, I wasn't talking about when you brought it. I was thinking of okay. when, you know, prior to when they were doing this, we didn't ha really have any say. So oh. that was never on the table and that was one of the issues. No. 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 Remember they had to come back right. And, right. and obtain the approval. They got, they got the approval, but they were never, never able to seek the performance bond and that's what started Correct. causing the delay. That's what resulted right. in the stop work right. order and then the commission voted to terminate and you would contract. greatly greatly reduce the events that you can host without a commercial kitchen and I have right. to tell you um, we did absolutely agree to moving forward when they came in and asked us in retrospect if you recall yeah. uh, of course it was a retroactive approval 100% Right. And, 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 you know, I do anticipate if the court does, we have a hearing on October 20th, I believe it is. Right. If the court allows us to amend our complaint, this would be part of the damages that the city would seek to recoup. I, I think that, unfortunately, this is from my perspective, we're not in a position where we have a lot of, um, I mean, our, choi so. our choice is to do it or not to do it. And I don't think that not to do it is a, is a viable solution. I think to do it is really what we have to focus on right okay. now. So I have only one more question. Sure. This choice of what is or is not a commercial kitchen, who's making that decision? I'm sure there are commercial kitchens down here and there are commercial kitchens down here, up there. 
because someone was talking about making it um, some place that chefs would come in and and oh, teach classes, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone having a party and needing a big oven or two or three. And just a little, that's just a lot of money, and I don't know that we're going to recoup it. it. It is, but we're here, like the mayor said. Yes, but we, we're here making a decision about another, uh, where's my glasses? Hundred and eighty three thousand eight twenty five and that's not even the beginning. I mean this is not even that's the end, rather this this might just plans. be the first of an iteration. I'm just concerned. So at, at some point, um, once a contractor is selected, that is gonna come before you. Mm -hmm. So there there's different elements of this that are gonna require your approvals. This is just a first set of approvals and staff is basing it on that previous discussion that we had, albeit it was a long time ago, but we're basing all that on that direction to, in order to move forward in, in what the mayor said. You know, this is the most cost-effective, efficient way. Otherwise, the other choice is to start with a fresh new architect who's going to have to go back and check all the work that was already done and then base their plans off of that. Which will be a much more expensive proposition, and we've done what we could to keep everybody up to speed in terms of moving forward. It's our so, best shot at not using that entire 1.3. Yes, sir. Fingers, That's exactly right. Fingers crossed, right? Good luck. This is the best opportunity to get to that place, sir. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Missy. Thank you, Missy. Thank you, Missy. Um, thank you. Moving on to 7BB, which was 6D originally, motion to retroactively approve Solid Waste Authority um, Blighted Distressed uh, Cleanup Grant. Was me again. Mm -hmm. um, just a little concern that uh, we're once again at a position where we're retroactively. I, certain words when they're in the cons consent agenda. Um, retroactive. Uh, let's go back and approve something that's already been been done. So I just like to hear a little bit about it. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the Commission, Sam Walthour. Director of Neighborhood and Community Services. Uh, Commissioner, it was simply a timing issue. We worked on the application about three business days before it was due. So for us to get it on the commission, we would have missed the all deadlines to do that. So that's why it's retroactive. And Mr. Walthour, and additionally, that three-day time frame you just discussed because you interface with the Office of the City Manager, yes. and it was just made available literally the day prior to that three-day window. So we were just on a short. Um, amount of time to be able to put the application together. Commissioner, also, just so you know, that um, particular grant is a grant that um, was discovered. Uh, I, I actually found it, and oh, right. we, we brought Thank it you. in, and, and it's something that we're able to use year after year. It's money that's coming to us to take care of, um, I guess, dilapidated buildings, right. or take, yes, you know, um, slum and blight, those types of things. So it's just money coming to us, which is a great thing. So this money comes to us on From a periodic? CSWA. Every year. Every year. That so, we, we apply for it. So if we're a little bit more careful and astute as to what is deteriorated and dilapidated, I think the uh, tenants at that place had been saying it for years mm. and obviously spoken on deaf ears um, until the point that it was about to cave in. Mm. So I just think we should be a little bit more um, forward thinking, forward looking, take a little bit more care of our properties. And so we're not last minute retroactively doing things that uh, are dangerous to whoever is occupying it, like this building. Okay. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Thank yes. you, Sammy. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to our um, regular agenda item 7A. This is resolution 98 22. Mrs. Anthea. Mayor, this is quasi judicial. Okay. I'm sorry. You're right. Appreciate that. So let me read into the record the quasi judicial rules. This hearing, this hearing shall be conducted in accordance with quasi-judicial rules. 
<clears throat> the applicant and the city shall be allowed 20 minutes each to present their case. The public shall be allowed to speak for three minutes each or a, six, or a maximum of six minutes if a person represents an organization or a group of people who are present but agree not to speak. The city commission staff and the applicant will be allowed to cross-examine a witness. The city or the applicant will be allowed to offer rebuttal testimony. The decision to approve or deny an application or appeal may not legally be made upon views as to whether a project is a good project or not, nor may a decision be based on the numbers of citizens who support or oppose a particular project. The law requires that all decisions must be made on the basis of whether the project meets the required law, the comprehensive plan, and the land development regulations. <clears throat> So we have several quasi-judicial um, hearings on the agenda. We have 7A and 7B. I believe that's, is that it? That's the Stan Ellen Bar, and yes, that's it. Okay, so if anybody is going to be speaking to 7A or 7B, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and be sworn in. Raise your right hand. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Thank you. I do. Thank you. Okay, so when you come up to speak, when you're asked to come up to speak, just make sure that you um, indicate that you have been sworn in. At this point, we're going to um, ask for um, disclosure of ex parte communication by the commission. Um, this is on, the first one is on. This is the Mason Rewall, 118 Northwest 11th Street. Thank you. All right, so we'll start with. Uh, now I guess if there's something on the server, but none. I don't none for me. None. Okay, very good. So at this point in time, we can enter the project file into the record, please. Uh, good evening, I'm Thea Genotis, Development Services Director. Um, I'd like to enter file 22-187 into the record, and I believe the applicant is here with the presentation, and very then good. I'll follow up. Thank you. So do I press this to move it forward? Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, there's two. I don't know. So usually that one, and if you're more comfortable, you can use the arrows. Okay, so great. Whichever way you Thank like. you. Good afternoon, Rebecca oh. Zissel, Sax Sax Kaplan, here on behalf of Michael Wool <laughs> for the waiver application. So this is the property. It's his house at 118 Northwest 11th Street, and the application is related to interior walls. It's a single family home, a 0.34 acre lot, um, the zoning single family and low density future land use. And this is an aerial view. The, the pool on the bottom center is the house. So the street you see is Northwest 11th. It front, that's the front of the house on that street. The house is at the front of the property and then there's a large backyard, that's the pool. Um, behind the pool is, the, is one of the two interior walls. That's the south wall. Um, it borders another single family home. It's 0.54 acres. Um, you can see that the, it borders the side of that home. Um, there's a lot of trees on the neighbor's property. And then the eastern wall is the other interior wall. It's at the top of the lot on this photo. And it borders another single family lot. It's 0.29 acres. It's also the side yard of a single family home. And the trees you see are also along that wall. Um, the specific section of the code for which we're requesting a waiver is 465C. It allows up to eight feet for these interior walls. It has to be measured from the undisturbed natural grade, which is where um, there was somewhat of an issue here, why we need the waiver. Um, I'll, as I mentioned, those are the locations, Eastern and Southern, and we'll get more into the details. Um, this is a shot of the backyard. The wall you see there is that Eastern wall. Um, the trees you see are all on the neighbor's property, so they're um, all along the wall, pretty dense trees. And um, the, oops, sorry. Um, the, the challenges here with the technical application um, of the height maximum, we had a contractor who didn't necessarily understand or adequately account for the requirements. Uh, here, one of the, situations is that it's a corner lot on the corner of 11th and 2nd. As I mentioned, the two roads differ in the crowns of the roads. The um, staff report went into this in more detail. The 
building pad could have been built at a height that was taking the average of the crowns and adding a foot and the contractor built it at two and a half feet above the higher of the two the roads differ by 1.44 feet in their crowns so you have a building pad that's about 1.75 feet higher than what would have been required and so once that was done and making decisions to keep a high quality aesthetic appeal you have a wall that um, is higher than eight feet in um, when measured from the undisturbed grade. So you have a building pad that's much higher than the undisturbed grade. Um, also, the measurement is taken pursuant to that code provision we just looked at from the exterior of the wall, which here is higher than the interior, which caused some discrepancies as well. So where you have the extra building pad height and that as well. So we're seeking a waiver to allow the walls to stand as built. This is already built. Um, there was a misunderstanding with the contractor um, and Mr. Wool is here and he'll speak to that briefly as well. Um, without a waiver, the solution would be to decrease the wall height to meet that eight foot requirement um, because it's higher than eight feet in, in areas. Um, it wouldn't cause any net positive in the aesthetics and be the same kind of look um, but just slightly lower um, it would meet the height to meet the height requirement um, just I know you're familiar with 247b5 the waiver requirements um, jumping ahead two and three are pretty quick ones it's not going to significantly diminish the provision of public facilities or create an unsafe situation so there's not much to say there it meets those uh, without needing anything to say number one it shall not adversely affect the neighboring area it's not gonna have an adverse visual effect. I know that it is taller than existing walls at neighboring properties, which is why we need the waiver because we're going over the code standard maximum. But it's nicely designed and the property overall, as you can see from the pictures, has appealing aesthetics. One thing I wanna mention briefly here, um, there is one of the photos that was circulated from staff shows the wall from the street and it shows that you could see the wall from the street even though these are interior walls and we wanted to bring this up and I apologize for not having the photo printed out I um, we just realized this today um, but that photo was taken this summer when the neighbor to the east was doing construction and all of the some of those trees that you see in the photo in the aerial view which is a Google map view uh, were removed temporarily. They are all back now and there is a lot of tree cover around these walls. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because the effect is that there are a lot of trees around these walls. So that does help as well. And in addition to them being interior walls. And then briefly, um, number four says that granting of the waiver does not result in the grant of a special privilege and then the language goes on to say in the code in that the same waiver would be granted under similar circumstances on other property for another applicant or owner and we know also it's mentioned in the staff report that there have been waivers in the past related to flood zones and this is not in a flood zone so um, we think that although this is not a flood zone that's not the only opportunity for a waiver uh, and that wouldn't necessarily mean this is a special privilege so the the situation is that if someone else were in this same similar situation with the different heights and the design and the specifics of this that it is we could expect them to come before you and uh, in a similar scenario with the similar design to get a waiver as well so accordingly it would not be a special privilege under the code definition so we're real briefly mr. wool is here tonight and he'd like to make a brief statement as well and we thank you for your time thank you thank you Hello, uh, waivers, the city commission, waivers, mayor, everyone, Mr. Johnson, first time coming to one of these. Uh, embarrassed to be here based on being here for the first hour and a half and seeing all the really interesting things that the city's handling and I'm talking about my interior wall. So I apologize for that. I did not know that this was such a serious gathering or meeting. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the first time I've ever built a house, first time at a city commission meeting. As my attorney mentioned earlier, we had a conflict with our contractor, so I'm currently in litigation. He ran off with the last two draws. I was left with six liens and 11 open permits when he just decided to stop working on my project, which apparently is a, a theme with South Florida contractors, but that's my problem. That's not what I'm here for. Um, I've, I've been able to close out the six liens and 10 of the 11 permits. The last permit is the site wall, which is what we're here to discuss. 
Um, one thing to note, additional to what Rebecca mentioned, which was the crowns of the, 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 the two streets on the corner lot are significantly different in height. And she mentioned we built the pad too high in addition, but um, the, the site wall itself is allowed to be up to eight feet. Our, our contractor asked for a six foot permit and was granted six feet permit, but it should have been asked for eight feet and granted eight feet. That's not the issue. It's that in some places, and it's really at the corners where the gates are, it's more than eight feet. Like in, so 70 to 80% of the wall is eight feet or less, but there are measurements for sure, and it's in the reports of the city and everything where it's eight inches high, 12 inches high, 18 inches high in one, in one corner. So <laughs> that, that's, that's, the, uh, that's where we're at. Field questions, I don't know. The, the gates that were put in on the corners there were custom gates put in at the request of the contractor. So not only would the heights have to be changed, we'd have to replace all those gates because then you'd have tall gates and shortened walls and it would be a little bit of a mess. Very good. Thank you so Mayor, much. Mayor, I'm sorry. Were you sworn, sir? Yes, uh, well, he, he I was. was. Yeah. Yeah. So you stated on the record. Yes, he did. It was Mr. Wall, right? I mean, what was your last your name? Wall. Mike Wall. Wall. Yep. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All right. So we're going to have the um, city then Thank present. You. Thank, Thank you. Oh, okay. I know you've been done before. Don't sweat it. All right, Darcy. Okay, so um, hang on just a second. I should be able to do these without them, but I still need them. Okay, so this is Resolution 9822, um, and it's a, a waiver to allow masonry wall to exceed um, the limitations in the code. Um, again, this is the property. It's in the Lake Ida Overlay District. It's on a corner in the R1 AA District. Um, and the waiver is related solely to um, the height of an enclosing masonry wall um, on the side interior in the rear yard. Um, this is the property. Um, so you can see a little bit of the wall right here. Um, building permit 19186239 was approved um, for the new home. Um, and it indicated at the time that the perimeter wall would be six feet tall all the way around. Um, the world is not flat, <laughs> so um, it's on a corner. So we usually we take the minimum required height in a flood zone X as um, a minimum of 18 inches above the average of the two crowns of road. Um, however, you know if if you can absorb more height within the limitations of the house, um, certainly you can raise a bit more. Um, however, um, in this case, it's not just that the pad of the house went up, um, it's that the entire yard was filled, which is something we've dealt with more frequently in the, in the flood zones of the city. Um, and so that's where I think the measurements um, may have gotten away during construction. Um, so the house was built at two and a half feet higher than the highest of the two streets. Again, not, not, not a huge difference, right, when we're looking at it, but, um, but ultimately, because it's not just that the house went up and there were stairs, is that the yard was filled, that then the yard that they're putting the perimeter wall on is higher than the adjoining properties and, and the streets. And so our code says in LDR 465C that our fence and height and wall, perimeter wall limitations are based on the quote unquote undisturbed ground, right? So in this case, um, as part of the construction, the lot, um, the, the lot was disturbed. <laughs> so um, in the end, um, I, think, uh, it was, I think it was at the final inspection or for CO, um, the inspector noticed that you know, compared to the adjacent properties, the wall is, is, is higher. It's fairly significant. Now inside the property, um, when you're in the backyard, you know, it's still a six foot wall, I'm pretty sure. There's a survey with all of the points that are, we've, that have been taken to, to resolve this. Um, so ultimately on um, Northeast 2nd, I have to go back to this so I can remember. <laughs> like, okay, so 11th is the narrow, okay. So Northeast 2nd is this street. I should have labeled the slide better. Um, they're allowed to have a six foot wall that they were approved on the permit for a six foot wall had they come in to change the permit to eight feet we would have done that administratively that's allowed by code there is a point where it's measuring eight feet eight and this is why we can't close out the permit because we need to resolve the fact that it's taller than it's allowed to be 
On Northwest 11th Street, again, it was approved for six feet, but it's allowed to go to eight. So we, again, can adjust that administratively. Um, and so when you're inside, at the highest point inside the lot, it appears to be seven feet, three inches. And from the outside, it's nine and a half feet. And these are based on us trying to measure it from the grade that's there. Um, and again, this is, you know, we haven't received a complaint from the neighbors. This was just closing out the construction site where it became obvious that it was taller than typical. And so we've been trying to resolve where do we go from here? Um, and ultimately where we go from here, whether the wall needs to be reduced in height, um, custom doors changed, all of that is depending upon your determination of the waiver findings. That is it going to adversely affect the neighbor, neighboring area. It does not affect public facilities. Um, it's certainly not creating a, a, an unsafe situation um, at this point. And ultimately, I think the main finding is whether or not it's a special privilege and would the same waiver be granted under seminal, similar circumstances on a property or in a, you know, in a similar situation. So you know, the question is when, when the neighbor redevelops, do we continue a this height? I mean, there's, there's that in terms of this. I don't think there's any doubt that it's a high quality construction and it's you know, a nice serious investment in the neighborhood and all of that. So it, you know, you're, you're looking at custom gates. It's just a question of how do we resolve it? Do we grant a waiver, um, taking into consideration the fill and all of that of the new construction? Um, the walls are not in the front setback. They're not in this, you know, coming forward of the facade at least. Um, and so ultimately, we just need direction as to whether we grant a waiver or whether you're directing um, us to make an adjustment in the height of the wall. Okay, very That's good. It. Thank you. So this is a quasi-judicial hearing. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to um, this issue, now would be the time to step forward and do that. So you'll state your name and address, and you'll have three minutes. <laughs> and make sure you tell me you're sworn in. I am sworn in. I'm Laura Simon with the Downtown Development Authority, but tonight I'm on this um, um, project speaking from as a resident um, and actually um, for my father whose house is directly across the street from there So and, and going up on this uh, street. So I, but I'm at 2838 Southwest 8th Street in Boynton Beach. But, um, but my family does live right across the street from this and I, I right now there, as, as Anthea said, there hasn't been any complaints on the project. There is um, serious redevelopment to the east, and um, I think this this ground, this property, has always been elevated high. So it's always been uh, higher than uh, and as you go up on Second Avenue, it goes up on that street. So it's always been higher. Um, I guess my concern from this is just moving forward. How does this not happen again? Mm -hmm. And how does this not? You know, I feel sorry for you as the. Um, as the owner but i do feel like as we go forward in the city with a lot of the redevelopment that's happening in our city how do we make sure that these things don't happen again so um and i'm sure they're happening all the time but i do think you know to move forward i think this is the best solution to grant the waiver however i do think there should be some measures in place to hopefully not happen again so very good thank, thank you. you anyone else seeing no one public comment is closed any um, cross-examination or rebuttal testimony from either the applicant or the city? Cross or rebuttal? Just sure, that. absolutely. Now would be your time. Um, thank you to Anthea. We do agree with everything, you know, her comments. And I just would like to emphasize that we, we do think hopefully when you do you know if you do have any in the future that you would still be given the chance to analyze the specifics that each waiver would need to come before you that's not to and that a lot of these are there are a lot of facts here as well as just policy so in here you do have the facts of the specific location not just the design which here is definitely a very nice design but also the facts with the heights and and everything else involved um, so but we do appreciate your consideration and if you have any other questions we're here. Thank you. you. Got it. Thank you. Anything? Right. And just, you know, ultimately to, to reinforce that, I mean, this is a waiver for the specific property, for the specific condition of being on a corner with two roads that are, you know, in, uh, with different heights. And if that factors in, you know, those types of things you have to think about, it's not necessarily establishing that 
the wall height for the city moving forward is nine and a half feet. It's, it's just really a question about how the impact is resolved here. You know, the, the project is tiered in a way that, that I think visually it, it does break it down. Um, but ultimately, this is a challenge we're having more and more as people redevelop our older neighborhoods and, you know, climate change and all of the other things we're concerned about. So it's interesting to hear that um, Ms. Simon was saying that the height, that the undeveloped lot in its previous condition had a pretty big grade to it or difference in grades. So oh, that's understandable sometimes how these things are in compliance at one piece mm -hmm. and then by the time they get to a corner, there's an issue. Thank you. Um, okay, so to the board, I, I just want to ask um, Anthea, is, you know, I, I know that there is a question as to the grade and the, and the crown in the roads. Mm -hmm. Is the highest point of this um, wall in compliance with the highest point of the grade on the ground? It sounds like it's not. Mm -hmm. So, and. So, do I'm you understand what I'm speak asking? To this too. You're asking that. Do, it does is it, the if, wall, if we were to take the highest grade of that mm -hmm. crown. Right. And then interpret the wall to it. Are we now at eight feet or are we still above that? So I think the issue, and I, I had some slides, but I'm gonna go to this one. I think that the issue is that the backyard is graded to be, you know, a flat level surface. There's a pool deck, you know, it's, I'm sure it's very lovely. Um, and so that's why it's, that's why by the time you uh, uh, take into consideration the highest point of the highest road, you know, that the, the fill was built at two and a half feet above that, okay, which is, which is fine. We mm -hmm. require 18 inches minimum. Right. The Florida Building Code mm -hmm. is going to make you put sure. another foot, and then if you wanted to freeboard, the issue is the house pad didn't go up, the whole yard went up. And that's what's causing the problem. I know, but when we, so, when you have the rules written into right. the, to the LDRs that say undisturbed, not what you're bringing in for fill. Right. It's undisturbed. So I'm asking the question: Is there any? Is there because we're talking about the crowns? I, I don't care about the fill, and I don't care yeah. about well, how high they made the house. I'm asking that when you're talking about from the undisturbed, are we looking at anything that? meets that standard or is this higher than that? And the reason I ask that is because I can understand if someone took a crown mm -hmm. and made a reference from that. I can also understand, and, and, and then it's eight foot and under from that mm -hmm. point. What is hard for me to swallow is, well, we raised our ground, so we're gonna use that as the, as the marking point, and then we're gonna go with that. That is going against our LDRs. That's right. something that actually is r running counter. And so that's the reason I'm asking this technical question. And I'm not saying that I'm not going to agree to this. I just want to understand it. So the contractor is not here. Right. <laughs> so for um, obvious maybe reasons. obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. But so I think what you can see is that uh, I think it's a combination of both, okay. quite honestly, from based on my judgment. Um, because you can see from this street, just looking at the yard, you know, that it's sloping a bit. And then mm -hmm. if you look at the front elevation, there's clearly, you know, what I, I always called a door yard where, you know, the, the front yard is terraced. Mm -hmm. I live in a historic neighborhood. These are on my street. Mm -hmm. It's a very common way to deal with a grade. So I, I sort of think that what you've got is a combination of one road being higher and it sort of mm -hmm. slopes a little bit and the other road then being terraced up. Mm -hmm. And so I believe, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the highest point of the wall is this piece right here. Is that right? So this is where I think this is the higher road. It sort of slopes gently to the one on the side there mm -hmm. and it goes all the way around the yard. And by the time you get to this point where the mm -hmm. front has absolutely been terraced and it is mm -hmm. higher, this is where you're getting the high, the, the most height when it, I hope I'm making sense. Yeah, I know you are, you <laughs> so are, I mean, I, I get it, but back in my I, think, I think, I think my question is answered that yeah. no, it does not, uh, at the highest point of the crown, if you were to then take that and add that eight mm -hmm. foot, we're still above that in, in yeah. that area anyway, okay. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the commission. Go ahead, um, commission, Thanks. commissioner. Thanks. Right, because he sh the wall should have been put on the outside and then the buildup occurring inside. And we saw this, I think I called mm -hmm. you at one point to look at a house because 
the whole backyard was flooded. The neighbors built right. up their house right. according to our standards and then put the wall on top. And so there was a negative impact, and that's why we have the rules and regulations. I agree with you, however. Your situation is unique, and um, I think I'd like to accommodate you. I feel it's unfortunate, but... As Ms. Simon said, what is the remedy going forward? Like, did not somebody go out and look at this at some point and say, oh, hold on, this fence can't be on top of this. It has to be next to it. So when we issue a building permit, we the, the height of the wall said it was going to be six feet. Right. Right. So right there, you've got a two foot sort of bust before you're out of compliance with the code and absolutely right. was a building inspector that caught it. You know, like I said, this wasn't a neighbor calling us like it normally is mm -hmm. somebody adjacent to a development saying, oh, my gosh, what's going on over there? It really was at the closeout where our experienced staff was like, there's no way that's right. right. And then we started digging everything up. Um, so anyway, that, Thank that's you. Why, why we've sort of stopped now. And so there is a remedy. I mean, I don't want you to think that just because it's mm -hmm. you know a very well constructed wall and to your point the issue we typically have when this happens it's, it's just a fence mm -hmm. and it starts washing down to the neighbors this is a wall with a footer that's not that impact is not happening as a result of the film right Phil because it is a perimeter wall um, so you know I think in this case whether it's you have to lower you have to take off a block course and undo the cap and take it down a notch and you know, adjust the, the door or the gate um, or not based on, you know, accommodating the disparate height between the two streets and the fill and everything that happened going forward. It, okay. That's the decision. Thank you. Vice Mayor? No questions. No questions? Thank you. Commissioner Johnson? I am very sympathetic to the owner. Um, I'm, I guess I'm going to be a difficult person tonight because in building a home, you're going to run into my contractors and doing what he's supposed to do, uh, just setting precedent. I don't quite understand how this happens. I know that there are bad contractors out there. This started just already being higher than it should be, and then it just got worse with a 12-foot fence. I just am not going to be in favor of it, and I do sympathize with you, sir. Sorry. Okay, well, it wasn't a 12-foot fence, just to make make sure that we are on the record. I heard her say 12 feet. No, no it's, nine. it's nothing. The, it's nine feet six at the at the highest I point that we've have. been able to see. So that's a foot and a half I would higher than the eight. really the don't. I'm Someone sorry. said 12 feet. I thought I heard 12 Wait a moment, feet. but Ms. Johnson, eight, it would be permitted. So it's only eight inches higher than what would be permitted if they got the permit No, no, because no, there are some points for that are nine. There's so points on, that are nine, nine, right. eight. So in oh, other words, right. there are some that are approaching. So on Northeast 2nd, again, because you're on two different streets that are, you know, the world isn't aligned. And so right. um, one side of the street, the highest point, based on what we've calculated, is eight inches taller than eight feet. Okay. And the other one is a foot and a half taller. So it's eight, eight to eight. Feet. No, it's eight, eight to eight. Eight and nine and a half to eight. Eight to 18 inches taller, yes. meaning that it's nine foot six Not inches. Not feet, but inches, I'm sorry. That's right. Nine inches. foot six inches at the highest point where it's only allowed eight feet. And I said feet, okay. and I should have said inches. My apologies. I, I'm just, as um, Ms. Simon said, if we allow this one for whatever, I'm sympathetic, the, con uh, the contractor was this, the contractor was that, unfortunately, it resolves, comes back down to the owner. So I'm just not going to be in favor. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Boston? Okay. Um, I also, I, I share your concerns as well. I think this was an extenuating circumstance, however. I think that... Uh, I, I don't know what we can do other than to have somebody remove uh, in the future any of those um, higher than normal um, uh, footage. You know, I, I think that this is a, this is the first time I'm dealing with this, uh, especially with the um, exterior. But that's not an excuse to not follow the rules. That's the problem that I'm having here. However. Um, I've also dealt with a, you know, a contractor walking out and understand, you know, the the um, the ramifications of that. Um, I would love to. I mean, one of the there was one picture up there where you really saw the starkness of the wall from the neighbor's house. Uh, there's a picture uh, with a three. There you go. Um, if you can see where that fence is, that that's very very stark to me, and it's and it and it really does just kind of block everybody out. It's not really what was meant to be. However. 
I don't know if there's a potential, you know, in the future, because I know this is probably on their line or very close to their line that they would have to buffer that, but I'm not going to ask for that here and I'm going to agree to um, overlook it, but I'm going to be honest with you. I won't, I won't overlook it again. And so this, this because it's the first, he's getting a pass, but I can't, I, I think that this is something that, I mean, I shouldn't say I can't do it. I have to give each one individual, but exactly. I, I don't want to appear that, that this is just a free for all. Do you understand what I'm saying? And it's not, but I think everybody has, um, you know, has process, and the process is a waiver. So they are entitled to right. bring that before you, and each waiver stands on their own. I agree. We're going to consider them based on the facts and circumstances. To me, you know, based on what you're saying, I think that you find that this is unique, yeah. that because of the grade of the two different streets and the crown, I think that gives you the ability to say that it, it's not conferring a special benefit because of the uniqueness of the property. And while, you know, there is some indication that, it, you know, the, the grade was changed as part of the development of the property, I do think that when you look at the two different roads and the crowns, I think that gives you the, what you need to support the waiver. Well, I have to tell you, yes, that would have been had I got the answer back that I was asking, which is that it does comply with one of those crown um, levels. It does not. It's higher than what they would have accepted at that crown, and that's the reason why it's it's harder for me. So it doesn't give me that uh, we're not offering a special privilege here, mm -hmm. if you understand what I'm saying. So I think you need to vote now. May, may I ask a question, <laughs> Mayor? May I, I mean, I think, you know, I understand. if that's how, what you think, then then I think you need to vote that they didn't meet the requirements of the waiver. Yeah. May, but, I, well, may I just add, um, ask another question? Um, we all know that there are these types of situations throughout the city. Nothing is where it should be. Um, and we're going to invite quality builders and owners who are requiring quality builders, we cannot just say, okay, you're gonna get it because, oh, I made a mistake. I'm just, we're just setting, rather, I know we're not no, setting no, no, a but precedent. I do agree with you. I think we have to take the contractor aside mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the issues and the litigation with the contractor, mm -hmm. that's very sympathetic, but I don't know if that necessarily goes to the criteria that's before you. Exactly. Criteria is very specific, and if you feel that you're conferring a special benefit for whatever reason, you know, if, if then you have to vote no. Yes. You know, I, so, and I understand what you're saying. I do think that what Ms. Simon said is compelling in that, you know, pre this development, the grade was different. And so, you know, I think if you wanted to support this, I think you could hang your head on that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you if you feel that you're um, conferring a special benefit, if you're going to do a strict reading of the four requirements, then I think you're voting. Mm -hmm. Okay, very so good. Yes. I do want to add one thing to you because I know you're you're talking about the 18 inches above mm -hmm. crown of road. That tells us where the floor slab minimum has to be. But the fence regulation is purposely doesn't take the fence height from that point. The fence height says from the undisturbed grade of kind of the dirt you're putting the fence on, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, the it's going to slope up or down or mm -hmm. do whatever from where the crown of road is. And so I think that's where um, there was a bit of a disconnect is that it doesn't, in, in a way, it doesn't matter what the, the, the average crown of road tells you why the, why the house landed where it did. Mm -hmm. Okay, it doesn't mean you have to mound your entire lot to get there, okay, to be fair. But the... The fence is from the dirt the fence is on or the wall is on because that could be a very different height from over here where we're springing kind of the, the flood zone type of, of measurement. I understand, but if somebody backfilled right. all around their entire property to build up that fence yeah. so that they could have a 12-foot high fence because they've built up a berm now around right. their property, I mean, that doesn't That's make any sense. undisturbed. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Okay, yeah. very good. All right, I think now, we, I don't know if I would have to get a picture of this for the record, but the applicant is asking for a picture with the landscaping and be passed around. I didn't have this. So. Can I just make a con one comment? Or I don't know. They, um, it's it's evidence. We, I don't know. If we don't have to show the photo. I just. Yeah, I, I yeah. don't think we should show the photos. No, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with you taking. I want to hear what you have to say. OK, this was just to address your this is directly on point with what you were just getting at, which is that it's regarding the left photo. Okay. And that's kind of what I briefly mentioned earlier. That actually does now have landscaping. Okay. So you don't need to see the photos. It was this was taken this summer. We we applied in May and this was um, the, the next door neighbor was doing construction. Gotcha. So okay, I, no, and, I, no, no problem. And okay. I, it shouldn't really affect my decision. Agreed. I just basing it on something entirely different. I, I just am looking at it and saying it is stark and it does kind of like it, 
it's yes, like, and that's just because when staff took the photo, what happened to be when the landscaping was removed. But got it. and I know it's just a complicated situation with the different the different heights, and um, not just because of the. And we'd hope that you look not just at the building pad situation, but the property itself. Thank you very You're much. Good. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to, um, to go return to what uh, Deputy Vice Mayor said about houses that are surrounding these type uh, developments. Um, we have that problem. And if we encourage it, we're going to continue to have it. We're not protecting those who are already there. They may not develop to this type of a uh, building, etc. So sometimes I think we don't, because they're not here to voice their opinions and their thoughts. Perhaps they don't even know we're talking about it. Um, I just think we should start protecting our neighborhoods. Just for the record, we send mailers out on this, yeah. don't we? Just a waiver, not a variance. So it's is it, it's just noticed in our agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is any, anything else? Sure. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Boston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. No. Mayor Petrolia. And I'm going to have to say no just because I have to stand on what I believe. It's already passed, which is great, but I just I can't do it because of the reasons. I feel like it is a special interest in my mind. So um, good luck, guys. And, um, you know, I know. Well, good luck. And thank you very much. I'm glad you came in and had to do the presentation. I was going to say to either, see you. either way, but I really enjoyed working with the city on the house build. Everyone in the permit office, everyone that came and inspected, and I was expecting to get rejected. I'm really appreciative that I wasn't. So thank you all. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you, you for much. coming in. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Moving on to uh, 7B Resolution 132-22. Um, As I do additional mayor. Yes, it is. So... Sworn. I've already, I've already, um, Everyone's been sworn, I think. yeah, I've already read into the, um, I'm sorry, we already had a swearing in process, but I think some people did come in afterwards. So if there's anybody that's going to be speaking to 7B that has not been sworn in, please stand and be sworn in. Thank you. By the authority vested in me as a notary of the state of Florida, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, very good. So at this point, we'll have the city um, enter the project file. Oh, sorry. Let's disclosure first, the uh, ex parte. And again, this is the standalone bars. But I have none. Nope. And none. Okay, so we'll enter the project file into the record. Uh, good evening, Anthea Geniotis. Um, the I'd like to enter file 22-219 into the record. Um, this is a waiver request um, from the um, standalone bar separation requirements um, that are still in play for a business where it's more of an accessory use. In this case, it's for Lack or Me Clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Akbar, am I saying that right, is here and he'll give you a presentation or an overview. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Hello. How are you? This is my first time here. So. All right. Give us your name again. Um, my name is Urshad Akbar. Akbar. Um, and I am the owner of Lacrimi and Albar, and I also have a partner, who, um, Josue Gonzalez, who is a former captain of the U.S. Army and also currently a veteran who is with me here in spirit. Um, uh, so the idea of uh, Lacrimi Clubhouse and the waiver is really just, um, wait, how do I do this? Uh, just like this, okay. Uh, I just want to show you what, what we are. So we are actually, the main purpose is we are a nail salon. Uh, we are family owned, as you can see, my wife and my daughter who's only 10 months old, uh, just established this business here in Delray Beach. And uh, we, we, are, we are a family owned business that focus on bringing clients to luxury of home with, uh, with uh, you know, above and beyond service. Uh, we believe in customer service and the customer's always number one. And we we and the customer has to vote always. Um, pride. We also take a lot of pride in our work um, and quality. Of course, it's the most important part of um, of our business. I'm sure a lot of here, maybe at least 60% of these people in this room are going to a nail salon. So really, really, uh, really, this is what we are. Uh, next, uh, one I want to show you is the. Our mission is to meet the service needs of the every beach residents who care about looking their finest while also de developing a relationship with businesses. Um, our services, our main services that we provide is really just, um, you know, manicures and pedicures, some waxing, and really the wine and beer consumption is really just 
just a sweetener. Uh, we, I don't, I know this is currently categorized as a standalone bar, but I, that's not really what I'm trying to do. I, I, I really don't want to be just a bar. Um, th so that's not really my intentions here. Um, here's just an understanding of uh, who we are. We actually have the same concept right now, which is a nail salon. It's called Lacrimi. Um, Lacrimi Nail Bar in Boca Raton, which actually already got accepted by the city of Boca Raton, where we provide the nails and manicures and pedicures, and you know, occasionally have a client who is getting serviced uh, receive uh, some wine uh, or, or, or beer. Um, most of our services are, are really just uh, an hour, an hour and a half long. So we are mitigating um, how much alcohol really get consumed. So it, it really is not going to affect the neighboring, uh, the, the you know, the neighborhood, anything in that matter. Most of our clientele is the working class, and they're not really, you know, uh, not there to you know to go to a bar. They're just really there for the for the grooming part. Um, uh, so this is this is a picture of our Boca Raton location, as you can see. Um, the the sale of wine and beer will will only be an accessory to the business and, and not the primary source of income. We do not plan of having any waiting area outside, nor do we plan on selling beer and wine outside the establishment. This is only going to be with our customer clientele during the service, nothing more. Um, we are already in the process of everything, as you can see. We've uh, you are really the last step to. Um, to uh, getting this thing done, so we really hope to get your uh, approval on this. Uh, our plan to serve our customers at the clubhouse, since we only provide wine and beer, customers will see service inside the building during business hours. The, the sale will not ad adversely affect the neighboring area, nor will it diminish the provision of public facilities or create an any unsafe situations. <clears throat> Our plan to serve customers at the clubhouse continued. So the, the sale of wine will be limited to inside the establishment during business hours and customers of Lacrimi and Nalbar uh, clubhouse uh, will be mitigated by the sale of alcoholic beverages. The business will not ne negatively affect the city in any way, um, as I just mentioned. Um, and uh, you know, the, the most important part is, you know, we, we all work very hard. So um, this, is, this idea is really just, you know, a, a pampering for yourself. Um, taking care of yourself, grooming yourself, and you know, nothing beats just another glass of wine while you're getting um, getting serviced. Um, I, I don't think that that uh, we we are in any way, shape, or form are affecting anybody in our neighborhood, and I plan on not doing so. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer that. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay, we're going to let the city do yeah. their presentation. Okay, so um, this is, I think, a, depending upon, you know, your input on this um, item, this is something that's come up before um, in terms of um, spas and uh, personal services that offer, you know, complimentary or beer or wine for sale. Um, there was a bit of a shift at the state level a couple of years ago where um, the license requirement is similar to if you were a business selling those items and um, so we don't have a distinction on our code for when it's accessory to another main personal service at this point it's something that with the larger alcohol you know um, ordinance that we've been directed to do that we will try to address um, so this is an opportunity to provide any income just in general about these types of businesses as well for this specific waiver um, the property is located within the commercial court um, part of the central business district um, and again it is um, within 750 feet of another um, standalone bar which is you know a business that is serving alcohol without food being um, sort of the main business so this is a aerial of where it's located and this picture of the building which I actually had to go and drive past this building. It's unusual that I don't recognize the property, but it's, it had not been on my radar, so it's quite lovely building. Um, and it's located, um, again, um, sort of north of the core of downtown. Um, so the conflicting business is Cigar Connoisseur Del Rey, um, which is located within 750 feet and on the same block as the proposed 
um, Lacrimi Salon. Um, and ultimately, there are two sets of waiver findings for your consideration with this business. Um, the, the ones um, for all waivers, which are related to whether granting this is going to have an adverse effect on the neighboring area, which is one of the main um, findings in this case that should be considered, um, whether it will diminish public facilities or create an unsafe situation, and if it is a special privilege. Um, and then because it's within the Central Business District, the additional criteria for, for downtown, is it going to result in an inferior pedestrian experience or create a significant in incompatibility with nearby buildings or uses, um, whether it's going to erode any connectivity or reduce the quality of, an, of a civic open space. And clearly, some of those don't even apply to this application. Um, we did bump into DDA today. So this um, was taken to uh, the, um, the DDA at today's meeting, so there is no memo attached like you're used to seeing. Um, but my understanding is that the board was supportive of the request, but I would defer to Laura to give you any more information that you may want to hear from them. OK, That's very it. good. So at this point in time, we're going to open it up to anybody who has a um, comment that they would like to come forward and state your name and address. Three minutes. Hi, good evening, uh, Laura Simon, and I was sworn in uh, from the Downtown Development Authority. Yes, that this did come to our board today for review, um, and we uh, they did support it unanimously. It is there were some comments on just the use being other if it was outside if there was a change of the nail salon to be standalone bar. So there were some questions and concerns if if that was allowed and it has to stay with this use. Um, it's also just pointed out to us too that this is the only one of one of two freestanding nail salons in our city that are service areas and it is surrounded um, and I know that Anthea brought that up but it is also surrounded in its current neighborhood by other similar uses of nail salons hair salons um, and um, re other retail nine arenas in that area so it does complement some of the um, other supporting uses there but it is um, it was supported by a board. So I'm here if you have questions. Very good. Anyone else? Seeing no one, public comment is closed. Any um, cross-examination or rebuttal testimony from either the city or the applicant? No. OK, very good. So to the commission, and that was the question that I had. I wrote down, is this something that we could change? It could be changed to a standalone bar from a nail salon because we're giving them that. So the use itself is going to dictate and it, it will not be allowed to change the use to just going into a straight bar? Correct. Correct. I mean, the waiver is being considered to allow the proposed Lacrimi nail salon. So I'll, I'll defer to Ms. Jellin, but ultimately it's not a variance that runs with the land. It's for this specific business. Okay. Yep. All right. And then the other question that I had real quick is, um, does Tipsy have, is it, is it a for sale uh, alcohol pro, uh, product or is this the first time that we're seeing this? Because it sounds, I was going to ask, is this for sale or is this just being a complimentary given? So Tipsy is actually located, it's the only lot that was left where they did not bump into a distance separation. So it's the same um, lic alcohol license. Mm -hmm. They just were not within 750 feet of another bar when they went in. So they were... But I think the question is, is, is it complimentary there or is it for sale? Um, it, it, but it, it's complimentary, but it doesn't matter to the state with the alcohol license because if you are not going to offer it complimentary to someone who anyone who walks in the door, it's considered part of the service you're paying for, and therefore they're making all of these. So regardless, it's still on the same licenses. level whether you're exactly. selling it or you're handing it out. Yes. It doesn't matter. The state still it sees it the same way. It doesn't matter to you as part of the business service, and that's very why good. all this licensing came in in the last few years. To uh, the commission, yes, yeah. motion to approve. Oh, does it? Well, does anybody oh, go ahead? Give a second sense. for discussion. Okay, and so any anybody else have a question or a concern? Of course. Yep. Of course, um, I seem to be the the old dowdy person here when it comes to um, separation of alcohol and anything else. Uh, I have a question: Is the cigar connoisseur? Does, do they have a liquor license? Yes. Do. Yes, they, and I believe they have uh, full liquor, not just a two COP for beer and wine. They have a f more 
that help. Yes. So we are, in essence, maybe just saying, here's a standalone bar, and oh, by the way, you can get your nails done, or you can smoke a cigar, or no. No. here we've got a... No. It's accessory to the use. So the main use is the nail salon, and the, the bar aspect is accessory to that. And like we just said, if they were to change their business model and just want to be a bar, they'd have to go back through the process. This approval is strictly limited to Lacquer Me, the nail salon. So all of our other nail salons can now come forward and ask to be um, given a waiver or having a permit because competition means that they do it down the street, I want it done here. Well, if they're within the distance requirements, they have to come before you. Okay, thank you. All right, so we have a oh, We sorry. have other examples of this in the city, correct? Right, so so this is the map. Tipsy is here, and you can see that Tipsy is outside of the radius for the other bars that are around, which is why they were able to locate without this process. In this case, they are within the circle that was already mm -hmm. there, and that's why they're here. Yeah, and we have barber shops, and I mean, I don't get my nails done without a rose. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the truth don't comes out. Eddie. <laughs> don't forget. All right, so we have, a mo we have a motion and a second. Um, call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Boylston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? No. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, moving on to nominations now. Um, forgive me. Oh, th congratulations and yes, good luck. Congratulations and good luck. Um, and wait for the others to come. And um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need some help. Ms. Kateri, I did not write the names down of who had the nominations, and I don't have anything in front of me. So yeah, me. do you? Yes, I do. Public art is you. Yes, I know. That is the mayor. It's like this. Oh, okay. She's got it. Never mind. I have a cheat sheet. All right, so I am the public health. I'm going to do Kalena uh, Feldman uh, make, the motion, uh, make a nomination for her. Second. Okay. Any questions, concerns? No. Call the roll. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? When you have this, you can. Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Okay. And yes. I'm next. Go, going right. next, a nomination for a code enforcement board. This would be Ms. Cassell. Mr. Butera? Second. Okay. Um, any questions, concerns? Seeing none, call the roll, please. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Johnson is okay, next. Okay, yep, I got it. Um, so the nomination for the Green Implementation, Implementation Board, Ms. Johnson? Yes, I am I put forth the name as Heather. Oh, before I do that, I'm very concerned that um, we're getting applicants who are answering the question, have you ever attended a board meeting mm -hmm. or visited the group or whatever, however it's stated, and more and more we're seeing no. Mm -hmm. I think that should disqualify someone. At least come to one board meeting. I mean, do if you, you see don't how even... few people you have to yes, choose from, I do. Mr. Long and would be the I'm only one. All I'm saying seven. is, perhaps, if you don't even invest in visiting the board, how do you know you want to serve? Okay, so it sounds like you're trying to roll that to me. I'll be glad to take that nomination. No, 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 no. <laughs> All right. Well, I, and ahead. and there's only really one because she's she's getting her. PhD in marine mm -hmm. biology, and hopefully that equates to something with the green board. Ms. Heather Seaman. I'll second it, but I'm going to vote no since you vote on no for everything else. No. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm it's a, no, 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 no. I'm teasing, I'm teasing. If you have a reason. Any questions, concerns? Seeing none, call the roll. I mean, I'm sorry, um, call the roll, yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. And yes. finally, to um, Commissioner Cassell, we have the nomination for the Historic Preservation Board. Correct. I'll take uh, Ms. Cullinan, please. Second. Okay. Thank you. Real, Go ahead. Real, real quick. This is for the Historic Preservation Board? Yes. Does it have to be one of the qualified at the top? That's what I was going to ask. I wasn't sure because I think we have, uh, I, we have I looked five. at the list and I think if someone should let me know that because if that's the case, I'll pick Mr. Weber. Uh, so right now the we have the qualification. Yeah. We have. <gasps> The one that was real. There's no one list. open, I think, right? So that can actually be the. It says unexpired. Could we, in the future, have that kind it of? It shows their titles should, as yeah. far as what they. I mean, it does show, but typically it says required. Mm -hmm. It highlights it. it they okay, highlight it. You if you need. Mm -hmm. And I want to say the person who's no longer on the board was from the. Okay, why don't we just forego this till next list. time? And, and, that, person, and that person was removed. Do you want to? Because of the latest attendance. Um, 
thing we passed, right? I mean, technically he shouldn't have been on there because of all the absences, but yes, when the new um, policy went into place, you missed right. another meeting, and so... Um, so technically, I should have a second choice, but anyway, go ahead. Okay, that begs a good question. If her nomination only made one meeting, shouldn't she get the I next choice? made a meeting. Choice? She, she get didn't make a meeting, choice. but I mean, technically, it should go to the next person, but if you want to... I thought we agreed... No, that doesn't seem fair. If your nomination doesn't even serve, you should get another pick. I mean, that's the weird thing the to me is that, situation, right? I mean, but, but the weird thing to me is that what you basically just said makes sense. She shouldn't have even been on there to be cho chosen, because I would have chosen the gentleman, the woman that uh, uh, right. Frankel um, had, had chosen. That was another one with a, with a, you know. So had he not been on there, then she would have chosen. If, if you else. guys want to, I'm agree okay with to giving you the choice. Let the mayor have another selection because I will. This. Yes, I, think that's I do. This is this is not a normal situation. I right? know it isn't. I know you can't you can't hit everything. Everything well, can't be normal. But I don't want to. If we encounter that again, I would appreciate if all of you gave me the opportunity. If someone I picked should have never been on the list. Yes. And then ultimately was discharged. I would think that my choice, I wouldn't have picked him if he wasn't on the list, or her. Or we could no? have checked his attendance record. I mean, he, he, hadn't, he had missed the last three up to his reappointment. But I don't think we had implemented those rules, and then, I don't know. I'm amenable to allowing you the choice in the rotation, because that was your Are we going to vote on it? We need to vote on it, right? Okay. I would vote on it. So make a motion. Motion to approve uh, Ms. Petrolia voting uh, for the nomination. Second. I think, I think you mean selecting. 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 Yeah, just selecting. Yeah. Right, okay. Call the roll, please. So we're just going back one rotation and starting oh, from there. It would be Correct. the one, I'm just filling the yes. spot that I didn't have. Exactly. Okay, go ahead. So call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Yeah, Petrolia? Yes. I'm going to go ahead and fill it with Mr. Um, if I can. It's up to you. I don't, I don't know if you were ready to do it. it would well, be I mean, I, I think I have to. Okay. There's you a, can do it. So I'll go ahead and fill it with Mr. Unless you want to take Mr. some Weber. time to work. Because he has the he has professional, that's from the qualified list. Second yes. trimester, Weber. Okay. Okay. So call the roll. Any questions, concerns? No. Call the roll, please. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. And that's how you get an extra selection. So I just want to thank you. I'm very magnanimous. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate you guys for um, allowing me to do that because I felt like I, so that was such a bum rap there. I so. Julie gave you her. Well, well not no, technically. Just roll back we just go we're going to roll it back, so the next one will so be. The next so one you don't would be mine. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So moving on to 7G, which ratification of proclamation of the emergency uh, resolution 172-22. Motion to approve. Second. Call the roll, please. Mr. Bolston. Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. Mayor Petrolia. Yes. Yes. Mr. Frankel. Yes. Ms. Cassell. Yes. All right, now we have a couple of, we have a first uh, public hearing, mm -hmm. and this is ordinance number 22-22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the City of Delray Beach Code of Ordinances, Chapter 4, Zoning Regulations, Article 4.3, District Regulations, General Provisions, Section 4.3.3, Special Requirements for Specific Uses, Subsection Q, Guest Cottage, to adopt standards for guest cottages greater than 350 square feet in size. Amending Section 4.3.3, Special Requirements for Specific Uses by enacting a new subsection QQ, Accessory Structures, to adopt regulations governing accessory structures in residential zoning districts. Amending Article 4.4, Base Zoning District, Section 4.4.2, Rural Residential RR Zone District, to modify the permissible accessory uses and structures, clarifying existing accessory use and structures, and add references to applicable land use regulations. First specific accessory uses and structures, amending section 4.4.3, single family residential R-1 districts to modify the permissible accessory uses and structures, clarifying existing accessory uses and structures, add references to applicable land use regulations for specific accessory uses and structures, and amending the special regulations to reference new standards for accessory structures. Amending section 4.4.5, low density residential RL district to modify the permissible accessory structures, clarifying existing accessory uses and structures, and references to applicable land use structure regulations for sp specific accessory uses and structures, clarifying the special regulations and adding reference to the new standards for accessory structures and special regulations. Amending section 4.4.6, medium density residential RM district, to modify the permissible accessory uses and structures, clarifying existing accessory uses and structures, 
and references to applicable land use regulations for specific accessory uses and structures, clarifying existing special regulations and adding reference to new standards for accessory structures in the special regulations. Amending section 4.4.7, Plan Residential Development, PRD. District to modify the permissible accessory uses and structures, clarifying existing accessory uses and structures, add references to applicable land use regulations for specific accessory uses and structures, and amending the special regulations to add reference to new standards for accessory structures. Amending section 4.4.17, residential RO district, to modify the permissible accessory uses and structures, clarify existing accessory uses and structures, add references to applicable land use regulations for specific accessory uses and structures, clarifying the review and approval process as it relates to historic structures and historic districts, amending Appendix A, definitions by modifying the definition of an accessory building structure or use, and enacting a definition for pool house, providing a conflicts clause, providing a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. <laughs> I thought we were gonna talk about that. I <laughs> So moving on to, um, this is a second reading, so we're going to do a presentation, correct? Right? <laughs> All right, so, yes. so this, um, this is a city-initiated request mm -hmm. um, to add design. It, it was a lot that uh, um, Michelle and I had to read into the record because it touched a lot of sections, but it's um, a pretty simple amendment. Um, ultimately, it's intended to add um, minimum design standards to the larger um, accessory structures that um, we see coming into um, our neighborhoods. Right now, um, Guest Cottage, some of the uses are kind of grouped together with some of the structures. So what you'll see is that um, Guest Cottage appears over and over again. We've actually pulled that out because it's a little bit of a different animal. So you're going to see it listed separately because they're allowed in some places and not in others. Um, and but there are some definitions that are added as well. And ultimately, the, the goal, none of these are in the city. Um, just we're not picking on anyone in particular. But um, you know, the, the, the concern is that um, some of the accessory structures that are coming in, um, the larger ones, really do need to u utilize sort of a similar architecture materials as um, maybe the principal structure. We already have regulations throughout our code that say they cannot be taller than the main structure. Um, and so ultimately, um, the issue is that, um, you know, so breaking them down, the rule for guest cottages is we have a size criteria. So if it turns into something more than 350 square feet, then it's going to move into having the, the design standards that you're, you're going to see here. Um, so um, there is one piece that the Planning and Zoning Board added. So while we have the rule that says the height of an accessory structure cannot exceed the height of a principal structure, um, in most of our districts, including our, our um, R1 neighborhood districts, or single family districts, we have a 35 foot height limit. And ultimately, there, there was a concern that um, accessory structures really shouldn't be taller than two stories. So um, that piece has been added that um, went beyond um, some of the discussion we have with the commission. and then. Outside of that, the larger ones, 350 square feet, not the 10 by 10 shed that you're buying that's pre-manufactured from Lowe's or Home Depot or something like that, but the larger ones that are 350 square feet or taller, or taller than 10 feet, um, that they have to be designed with a similar architectural style and finished with material similar in appearance to the principal structure, um, and that they have to have foundation landscaping, that um, they have to have doors, windows, overhangs that with a decorative appearance consistent with the overall architectural style of the main house, um, that you can't have a, a really large blank wall facing the street. So they're very minimum, minimum standards. It doesn't say what style it has to be. It just says it has to sort of be consistent with the rest of the, of the property. Um, so again, um, it touches all of the residential districts. It adds cross-references. It's sort of reorganizing the list. Um, some of what was repetitive, like can't be taller than the principal structure over and over and over again in the code, has been sort of grouped into one set of instructions that will apply to all of them. So there's um, some consolidation that's happened through that. We're also suggesting that we add a definition for pool house. This is coming up over and over again with staff. Um, where someone says we want to have a pool house, but the pool house has a kitchen, a bathroom, and two rooms. <laughs> and we're like, um, that doesn't look like a pool house. That looks like you have built a small house in your backyard. So 
while we are, I think as a city, uh, you know, about to embark on accessory dwelling units, we did commit to doing them on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis um, to make sure that the impacts can be absorbed for other units. We do have the issue of Airbnbs and other things. And so we, we are suggesting that we add a definition for pool house, which recognizes it is a detached structure, but you know, clearly says this is not a mini dwelling unit. That's you, what your guest cottage or other things are for. So um, ultimately the findings that you have to make are that uh, making this adjustment to the LDR is consistent um, with the comprehensive plan. And, and we have several policies in housing related to ensuring good design and protecting our neighborhood character, but and also you know, updating and streamlining our LDRs so that the instructions are clear for our residents and investors that come into the city so they know what is expected of them. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board um, did review this on June 20th. Um, they recommended approval um, with the direction that staff work to develop additional standards to control the bulk and scale of accessory structures. And as you know, we've had a um, direction which we'll be focusing on this year to look at the bulk of single family houses, um, particularly in the beach districts. So all of this coming into kind of controlling the scale and the design moving forward. So if you have any questions, we're here. The board. Huh. Right ahead. I was going to say Let's motion start. to approve. I was going to say no. Okay. No, I, for discussion. I did have a question because when I brought this up for the first time a few years ago, mm -hmm. it was specific to the West Atlantic Redevelopment Plan. Um, they were actually requesting to be the first neighborhood. Have mm -hmm. we identified what areas will be so, addressed first? So this is outside of it being an accessory dwelling unit. Mm -hmm. This is the sheds and the other things that come in. Um, so we have, um, I've had discussions, Renee, Renee Jadising has honestly been waiting for me to have the bandwidth to be able to address, but she's a ready, willing partner mm -hmm. um, to start looking at the Northwest, Southwest neighborhoods. And at some um, level, it makes um, sense to, you know, the older districts that have alleys and things I think are more conducive to come out of the gate to be able to absorb that. So that is where we'll be starting. We are going to be reaching out and finding a consultant to help staff. Um, with those analysis and um, so while we get there for yeah. accessory dwelling units in the meantime all of the different accessory structures Lean and uses down. that we already allow now have some design standards um, just minimum architectural quality <coughs> standards to keep them from being you know big tin buildings that are sitting next to a really cute little house that looks out of ordinary no I remember yeah. in goal setting either in 19 mm -hmm. or 20 you bringing that up that right I was on step five. Yes. <laughs> so so <laughs> we're getting like there. Four other steps. So this is obviously yes. a big one. Yeah. And then, of course, addressing it um, mm -hmm. citywide at the time. But right. we will also be taking a neighborhood by neighborhood approach. Yes. For the actual kind of unit that you're legally allowed to have and not just pretend it's a pool okay. house, that is what we're going okay. for. Okay. Um, so that's going to be the focus this year. Okay. Right. This was well, a public hearing. So let me go ahead and open it up to anybody right. who would like to step forward and speak to this issue. If there is anybody here that would like to. I don't think there are any. Seeing no one, public hearing is closed. Back to um, commission. Long time coming, yeah. Definitely okay, so we've got a, a motion and a second, unless there's any more discussion. I did want to discuss sure. this. Are you now saying that we're going to go throughout the city and where there are uh, two sheds that are rusted and falling apart, that we're going to say you're no longer in conformance and we're going to have them removed? No, I don't think I can do that legally. What we are saying is that just in case someone's right, listening so, and they so take that back. I out appreciate into the what community. you're saying. I see what you're serving up to me. So let me make it clear for the record. If you have a tool shed in the backyard that exists today um, and it's less than 350 square feet, none of these rules would apply to you anyway. If you want to put in a new tool shed and it's less than 350 square feet and it is not taller than 10 feet, you know, there really aren't design standards that would apply to that either. Once you are building a more substantial building, a detached garage, a detached workshop, um, and it is more significant in size, then these house. very minimum standards um, basically are saying that it really needs to be designed um, in a similar architectural style and finish as the main home so that it all comes together into a cohesive design. Um, and that's just for the larger detached accessory structures. Very good. I'd like to Thank you. end the discussion, uh, but in 
the future someday, we would, it would be nice if we could go Northwest, Southwest and help them improve their tool sheds. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, call the roll. I'm sorry, Mayor, I didn't hear the motion nor the second. Ms. Cassell and I was the second. Yep, you both. Yep. Okay, thank Cassell you. Cassell did the motion. Okay, thanks. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Franco? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Thank you, Anthea. But you don't go far. <laughs> ordinance number, uh, this, is, these, this is now we're into the uh, first reads. This is ordinance number 15-22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, adopting a small-scale land use map amendment, redesignating a parcel of land measuring approximately 4.5A plus or minus acres, located generally east of Interstate 95 and south of Westland Boulevard within the Waterford Place Special Activities District, is more particularly described herein from transitional to general commercial, Pursuant to the provisions of the Community Planning Act, Florida Statute Section 163.3187, providing a conflicts clause and a severability clause, providing an effective date and further purposes. Again, it's a first read. So. This is first reading. Mm -hmm. And this Motion is not approved. a public hearing. Second. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson. Yes. And moving on to ordinance number 26-22. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances, Appendix A, definitions to adopt a definition for eyeglass store as a retail business selling glasses with limited optometry services, providing a complex clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, call the roll, please. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Ms. Cassell? Yes. Mr. Bolston? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Mayor Petrolia. And yes, um, ordinance number 30-22. I know, another one. <laughs> An ordinance of the city. I want to space these out a little better. An ordinance of the City Commission of the City of Delray Beach, Florida, amending the land development regulations of the Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 2, Administrative Provisions, Article 2.4, General Procedures, Section 2.4.3, Submission Requirements, Subsection A, Standard Application Items, and Subsection B, Standard Plan Items, to clarify the requirements for application and plan submission for green building certification. Amending section 2.4.6, procedures for obtaining permits and approvals. Subsection B, building permits to include green certification as a requirement to obtain a building permit. By amending chapter three, performance standards, article 3.2, performance standards, section 3.2.3, .3, standards for site plan and or plat actions. To add a new subsection L, referencing the sustainability goals and regulations for development of site plans. By amending chapter four, zoning regulations, article 4.4, base zoning district, section 4.4.13, central business, CB district subsection F architectural standards to clarify subsection 9 reduction of urban heat islands providing specifications for roofed and non roofed areas and to delete subsection 10 green building practices in its entirety by amending chapter 7 building regulations to enact a new article 7.11 sustainable design and construction practices to provide green building certification requirements application procedures and bond requirements for city and private development and by amending Appendix A, definitions to add a new definition for sustainability and resilience fund, providing a conflicts clause, a severability clause, authority to codify, and providing an effective date. First reading. Yes. Motion to approve. Second, but could we have a brief uh, discussion? Sure. One of the things we talked about is between first and second, if we had something mm -hmm. you know, that we thought should be modified. And I know we had the option, optional item, Kent, of the 50,000 square foot commercial going to silver, I would be amenable to that. And so I don't recall where we all left off in the last discussion, but that's not incorporated, I believe, in the agenda, that option, as it current, currently stands, correct? Uh, in the uh, draft ordinance, there is the 50,000 citywide silver? add silver. Okay, great, thank you so much. Okay, any other so questions? It's 20,000, 20, you said? Uh, it, it's 50,000 citywide, so the that current... Is now, but what's in moving forward? It, it continues at that same 50,000, um, but expands to citywide. Citywide on commercial? Uh, it actually does not make any uh, distinction between different types of, of construction, so it would be any building or development <coughs> um, on a single parcel of 50,000 square feet or greater. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, I know this is first reading, and we're not really supposed to. 
I don't no, know. No, you can give us can. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's I have, appropriate. I continue to have a, a, a real issue with the numbers. I know you and I have discussed it. I've said it publicly up here. I think we need to get far more aggressive on this and put a plan in place. Um, as you can see up there, the Green Implementation Board put 5,000 square feet. That would, that would put us up there in the, um, the leaders in our, in our state. Um, you know, I could, see us, I could see us doing silver. I can see us considering maybe 10,000 square feet and getting to 5,000 square feet, you know, in over the next you know, five or six years, setting some goals. Um, but but 20,000 20, square feet, 15,000 square feet, it's not, it's not enough. It's not a big enough impact. We're, we're, a, we're, we're a small coastal city. We should be leading the way. And um, this is not impactful enough at all. 20,000 square feet, and, and we don't even have that many buildings that are you know built for 20,000 square feet and above. Well, I think if we, we haven't done anything. We've been a year talking about it, though, and we can't get to that place. So I want to start. I would have preferred we started last year, even if we started low, because then we would be doing something. And there are a lot of, I believe in our discussions in the past, there are a lot of areas that aren't doing anything. Is, is that correct? Boynton even, maybe. I, want, I understand what you're saying. We want to be leaders, but we aren't even starting because we can't get past the finish line of the conversation. So I, I would like to, to start. Right, but... The consensus was to... We weren't getting consensus. This. Right, but we also got, reached out to the community. We got community input. We consider that important. We've done our due diligence in that regard. We have something in place that everybody is pretty happy with and i i don't disagree with you though that we should have very real short-term goals for one first we get this Im implemented in, and then two we look to improve and, and there is a provision that it will be revisited which was uh, a, a very good suggestion a lot of the communities behind that making that first step to get something uh, in place especially as a requirement because there there are a lot of green building ordinances most of them are voluntary or incentive based which mm -hmm. money right now is kind of hard to come by so that incentive um, should be looked at later um, the other main type of incentive is permit processing time frame and, and again uh, that's going to be in in place very soon I think with the e permitting but without those incentives in, in place right right now um, you know that that would be a comparison to a lot of other ordinances there are very few ordinances that have a requirement for obtaining a green building certification at any level thank you and I appreciate I know you did a <clears throat> lot of work to get us to this place and I, I really I respect what you're saying I honestly do but I do think we have to move forward and start somewhere I'm disappointed we didn't start a year ago and I'm very excited about this thank you I support this Okay, so didn't we have a, a, a motion and a second? Yes, yes we did. Yes. Okay, anything for, else? Yep. For discussion, we could have started last year. This is what I was worried about. So when there was a consensus to go back out to the community who came in here, and when you say community, we had these public meetings. They were, you know, industry, really. It wasn't, it wasn't the vast community. It was industry. It was builders. It was, car, it was bu primarily those meetings were builders, contractors, architects, people that were in the industry giving us some really good input. I mean, we, we, we tweak some things in regards to how to roll this out, in regards to um, it not always being lead, but um, the word you use is lead equivalent, equivalent mm -hmm. right? We got a lot of good feedback, but you know, one thing that I mentioned in December when I was ready to pass it at 5,000, I was ready to go with green, uh, the Green Implementation Advisory Board's recommendations, but I said, well, I will not water this down. I, I, I want I want all the input on how to best you know, how we how we can roll this out how how we can phase it in but I'm not going to water this down, and uh, and that's what happened. We had this year delay, uh, which I was not in favor of, and now it is absolutely watered down. And um, unfortunately, not only us, but our state, our country, our world have been dragging their feet way too long. It, there's no more baby steps when it comes to the topic of sustainability. There is no more baby steps. We have to make large steps. We need to take leaps forward, and um, and this this is nowhere near near good enough. I can't be in support of this. This is nothing. This is a drop in the bucket. I listen. I'm not disagreeing with you, but a year ago I said let's just start at fifty thousand silver and up across the city. It made no impact. What? But you could have voted for it. It would have made an impact what's actually. Your, not to dispute this, but there have been fifty thousand uh, square foot developments going through the process since a year ago. So it actually would have had an impact. 
but I do appreciate, and if you do enough, we talked about the lead. It's very challenging for people to get to gold or even a gold equivalent. We're not trying to make this a hurdle for the businesses in our city. We're trying to get people on board with our idea that we have to be doing something. And the idea of starting small is so that we can get everybody, the residents excited, the business owners excited, so that everybody wants to do it. Look, you don't have to vote on it. I'm not, it's your vote, obviously, but I'm excited. You put a lot of effort into this, and I, I wish we had started 50,000 silver a year ago. That's what I was suggesting. What's your, what's your reasoning for not going with a lower square? All the community input, the Green I implementation think, board said 5,000. Why, why not meet in the middle? Because our staff worked on this tirelessly, and they came up with that number after oh, numerous brought, meetings. No, last year they brought the 5,000 forward. And then they had meetings. And then... And then in they those meetings, it. they suggested 20. So why right. not meet it? Why I'm, not meet Because somewhere, I'm going with their suggestion. Somewhere in the middle. Okay, so it's it's not a debate. I mean, I get what you're trying to do is yeah, to I understand convince, totally. But I think that we have different opinions, and I think that we. I just I, I just want to know why 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 not a lower square footage? The staff the recommended we start here, and then move up, and I'm fully amenable to that because I and want I think, to start. I think it was asked and answered. I I, I want to start. I wanted to start last year with this. Fifty thousand in silver. Yes, I did. Go to go look at the meeting. All right. So um, you said I'm you're not going any lower than gold. I'm going to call the, the question. No, I said I May. would. I would say, I said I would consider. I would consider okay. meeting halfway. So I did. Actually, I said I would go to silver. I said I would go to ten thousand. You guys can be here all night talking about this. <laughs> so I'm calling the question. Please, please, um, uh, call the call the, the roll. Miss Cassell. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Mr. Boston. No. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Mayor Petrolia? Yes. Mr. Frankel? Yes. Okay, moving on. Thank you, guys. Good debate. Um, we are at com uh, comments and inquires of non-agenda <coughs> item. Mr. Moore? Nothing further at this time. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Jellin? Um, I was just going to take a minute to publicly thank staff, um, specifically Anthea's team. We were able to accomplish our board member new training. Oh, good. Um, it was really, um, it was great. It was nice to meet the new board members. It was nice to talk to them. They had great questions. They're very engaged. So I wanted to thank Anthea and her staff for um, all their help and assistance. And we also completed, um, uh, Mr. Dunkley and I completed uh, in-house purchasing training. And so we educated all of our, our buyers in the different departments and the staff on our purchasing policies and procedures, and I think it was very successful. Very good. So to the commission, who wants to start? I think there's two commissioners have that have items. I think. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Commissioner Boyle, you're right. An item and Let's start with uh, the uh, 10C1, which is Deputy Vice Mayor Julie Casals. Uh, okay, I have a couple things. Should I do the presentation and then my items, or does it matter? No, do your do the discussion item first. Okay, so my discussion item is um, with respect to. I have actually. It's a two part. Um, a pathway program to increase diversity in medicine and biomedical research. And it's actually really exciting. Um, the two parts are this. Well, first of all, I want to talk about a wellness fair. I think, Mayor, you were an advocate for this in the past. Mm -hmm. and I, I know um, Pastor Dawkins is here, mm -hmm. and Reverend Barr was here earlier. Um, and they worked on that with mm -hmm. you. You know, these gentlemen have been serving our community in ways that we can't always do that. During the COVID, you were providing food, even toilet paper and paper products that were hard to come by, um, vaccines. You opened up your church for our community, and I really appreciated that. I participated to the extent that I could because I was so excited that you just were stepping out and helping the community. And one of the greatest ideas that they had is a wellness fair. And the reason is that most people who don't have resources do not prioritize uh, health care over food, electric bills, and the like. And I think the number is something, I wrote it down now, one third of Americans say that their family members have delayed medical care or treatment for serious injuries specifically because of the cost. And an additional 10% say they delay just getting care for insignificant medical issues again, for the cost. So the idea is one, part one is to close the street, Southwest 10th um, from Atlantic to First to have a medical services fair. Tents up, healthcare screening, we can do mammograms, uh, check for heart disease, kidneys, wellness panels for men and women, podiatrists, Alzheimer's testing, anything that we can get people to do. And I'd like the city on board to work on that. I think, um, 
in the past, we closed the street. We had um, police and fire, and then the vendors came. Um, I don't think there was a cost beyond that, and I think that's still workable. And I think it would be a great thing to provide to our residents in need. So, um, and that I'm thinking six months from now would be. So we have a, we have a, the, their understanding that they're they're interested in doing this again. Correct. Yes? Okay. Yes. All right. So uh, driving, and I would love to work with driving them. this. This is driving, nothing yeah. that's Correct. going to be assigned to a different department. Okay. Correct. So that's number one. So I have Sorry. approval on yeah, that I'm, part. I'm good with it. Fabulous. fabulous. Thank you. And the Very second. Very well attended last time they did it. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's a fabulous uh, opportunity for mm -hmm. our residents. Um, so um, Pastor Barr and Pastor Dawkins, along with FAU and members of our community, have created a community-based program aimed at recruiting and ret retaining students into health care. Mm -hmm professions and biomedical research and the program so this is there is a program actually uh, happening uh, as we speak at FAU and if you go online and search you can find it and what the program does is provide lessons and activities focused on um, biological sciences career exploration clinical exposure college college preparedness and also um, financial literacy so there's an a mentoring aspect to this program there's also a required commitment on the part of the parents or the guardians of the youth. And the goal uh, is to, to sort of work with that program in our city to basically distinguish some youth who don't have resources and could otherwise never get the exposure to go into these fields to join this program. Now, the church is offering their um, facility to house the classes. They've purchased computers. And the church is willing to donate church funds towards this program. FAU is involved, and they will supply the programming. They have the programming. So community um, members are also providing funding. And what I'm looking to do, FA, FAU is offering the program. You can read about it online. They're collaborating with the school district of Palm Beach at the, at the present moment. Their um, local organizations are collaborating with university partners, faculty, staff, students, and they've outreached to over 500 kids. I'd like to see some of our children in our city able to participate in this program with the help of this church and these gentlemen. Um, I think we should participate in this program in a collaborative way with FAU, with the church, and with the members of the community who are financing it. Um, and I like to think of this, look, if you look at this, this isn't a handout, this is a hand up. Someone said that at the um, Habitat for Humanity groundbreaking, and I love that saying, because you're not, you're, you're, you're giving assistance to get to a place, and I think I like that. Uh, the comp plan provides support for this initiative. Um, basically, objective EDU23, collaborate with the school district the county and community to improve educational programs for middle schoolers. Same thing, EDU24 for high schoolers. This program would start in sixth, work its way all the way through high school. And if the child is successful in the program and opts to go to FAU or Palm Beach, they will get a scholarship. The only requirement is that they retain a 3.5 GPA. Um, another um, aspect of our comp plan is um, EDU 2.34, support programming efforts provided within the community and the school district, which strive to prepare middle school students for the rigors of high school. Uh, EDU 2.44, encourage uh, programming to increase the youth pipeline to employment, utilizing meaningful and lifelong job skills that will result in wealth building and grow your local economy. Objective EDU 2.6, support programming by local organizations and businesses which provide additional educational opportunities in a non-traditional setting. And uh, in close, any, uh, I already said that the kids would get a scholarship. You know, I would, I'd, I'd hope that we would consider participating in this program to support some of our underserved youth who might not otherwise have the opportunity. And, and I look at this in a way, we've changed things with our education director. Miss Meeks is gone. I'm not sure how the, the, what the um, drive it for how we can work with the Palm Beach schools and how we are going to have our 
new education director work, but I was I feel like we should start looking at programs like this because we don't have the ability to really impact a great change through the school system. So what's the we ask? can hear. Yes, what you what are you asking? I don't have I want to I what I'm asking is it's probably going to be a monetary donation. And I think because they've already got the classrooms, they've already got the computers, and they've already started the programming. See, uh, in a good situation, I'd say, hey, let's provide this, let's provide that. But I can't give a very specific item. What we need to do is be able to help facilitate this, this situation with the kids. It may be the cost of tutors. It may be you know additional snacks. It may be, I'm not sure what it is at this point. But I just want to know if we're on board to have the discussion I and if we're on board to be willing to dedicate money. I, I would say that I'm on board for someone to come present and tell us mm -hmm. all about the program in a formal capacity. Um, Did you think that wasn't enough information? No. Okay. okay that's so really not how things are done. I mean, obviously, staff would reach out to the partners in the community. No, no, that's SAU, what I'm asking for. They would come, presentation, public I, notice. I think, you, I, think you I think you have support to you. move this forward to find out what you're actually asking of the um, commission and right. the city. So I, I, I think, yes? No? I, 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 I appreciate the presentation. I mean, to, to make, to make, to, that's what I'm saying, to take I the next step. step to a presentation, yeah. not a blank I, check. I am, here I go again. Um, our school district does get so much money. And we as a city, and I can appreciate the need for an outreach to try and reach those kids, expose them, children rather. Uh, expose them to this feel, et cetera. Um, I would like to see our new uh, education coordinator work a little bit more collaboratively with the district to see how we can do this in the school setting where the children already are. And thank you for all that you've done to try and, and participate with this church and getting our children exposed, et cetera. I just think we should put a little bit more pressure on the school district to educate. Fine children, yes. Um, I'm just not sure. I don't disagree with you on that, but we know that that hasn't really been successful. And the problem I have with us relying on the school district is it's gotten us where we are. Look at our schools, no offense. The quality isn't amazing. We had that whole meeting to try and figure out that, a, a, I'm just saying, it's true. I mean, and we weren't able, we don't have the ability to persuade them to do particular things. So if we're going to get something done, we have to do it ourselves. And look, this is a great opportunity. FAU is offering this program to kids in our city. They are fortunate. I think that FAU here in, in the room, tell us all about that program and, and the opportunity. I'll, I'll arrange that with Mr. Moore, just, the church and more. FAU. Love I would love, that. fabulous. I thank you for that. I have a question. Sure. What's the difference between this and the solar panel discussion? I'm serious. I thought the points Ms. Johnson brought up earlier. No? What's the difference? I think this is a partnership with an established education, uh, an established but school. But it's giving money to a nonprofit. No, it's, no, it's, no, no. no. I think it's, it's a, a partnership program. through the school. I, I, FAU. Candidly, I don't know enough about it to speak to you, but I, if it's a partnership with the school, I think that's very different than a co-op or a nonprofit. So I think I think staff should obtain the information from De uh, Deputy Vice Mayor Cassell. We will look into it. If it's something that staff can make a rec recommendation on, we'll bring it back to you. If there's a funding aspect, obviously that would be brought to you. There's not going to be any blank checks that are written tonight. No, of course not. We don't I think you need checks. to have a little more information. Yes. Remember, these these items that are coming before you. This is just for us to discuss and for you to say, can to we go forward to, take the next to the next step? And I would so, like to go to the next staff step. Staff hasn't looked at any of these items. This is just an opportunity for you to memorialize what the discussion is to make it easier in the future. You know, if we want to go back on agendas to see where something was initially discussed. Well, for the record, I agree with Ms. Johnson. I think our taxpayers. Uh, are very generous to the Palm Beach County School District, and if, I, I think we should ask for an audit on where the tax dollars are going because they get I think millions, brings, millions of dollars. And Ms. Cassell brings up very good points that the funding for our local schools is inadequate based on what we contribute. Exactly. Well, I'd like to know that, but 
for another day. That's another discussion. I, I, but wait, I, I, so we have a consensus, though. Wait, there's more. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's what you hit me. Go ahead. <laughs> She don't, she's in a roll. Just cast a little shade up. I'm casting a little shade up here. Miss Johnson has to get to a bus tour at 8 o'clock. I know. Okay. That's all right. Don't we worry about We have the consensus me. for the fair, and we have the consensus to for me Move to get forward. together with them and staff to get something together, which has a very specific no, I, I really don't want to, you know, waste anyone's, anyone's time. So maybe if, you know, staff can get with us individually. Um, but obviously with uh, Commissioner Frankel, Commissioner Johnson's concerns, and depending on what that, I don't know what that number is. You're saying a monetary donation. Is that? I didn't throw out a number because, look, maybe you're saying I'm willing to do this amount, but I'm not willing to do that amount. Me, I would like to so, see So what I would like to have that conversation with staff prior to requesting F FAU and all the partners to put a presentation, get on the agenda and everything, because I'll be able to make my decision maybe just by looking at that number. Perfect. Okay. And I'd that love to great. see it be done in the school system where the classrooms are probably a little bit more adequate than the church. I, I'm not disparaging your church, sir, but it's if we have 100 children, can you accommodate I don't think that, that the, just to be clear, I don't, they're not looking to serve only children in their church. They're looking to serve children in our city who don't have the resources and may not otherwise get exposed because this is not happening in the public school. P kids aren't being selected in a science class by a teacher saying, this child maybe would be good in this field. They're not getting that kind of individualized attention, and that's the point of this. So you're taking a person who might not have that opportunity and giving them that op opportunity based on the idea that they could probably embrace it and create a future for themselves. It's not – look it. I'm uh, sorry. You know, I, I, think, I think you have the step forward, and I have to tell you, I – I had an, a conversation, I want to say maybe about a year ago with the, with the church, and this really was focused on um, young black males who are not, by, by number, not going into the medical field, and they're questioning why. And it was pressed upon me, I, I serve on the, um, the uh, board over at the hospital, um, you know, why is that? And there's, it's just a huge differential, and it seems like there is just no path for those children to go in. And I think this might have been broadened to the entire city of children, but um, I did approach my board and said, is there a way that we can mentor, um, especially uh, children who, you know, uh, doctors who look like the children that are coming in too? Mm -hmm. Because that would be so impressive. And I, and I get this, it's not our job in this capacity to do this. This is truly where I think that there is some falling down in the community, but what do we do? Stand by and watch it fall? Or do we actually embrace take, an opportunity? Take a step, and I mean, I'm telling you, in, in um, Janet Meeks's you know, history here, take that step and really push forward to, to make a difference and, right. and to make a difference for our, our community. And I'm just saying, I welcome it. Mm. I don't know where it's going to go. There's going to be a point where I would probably have to say I agree with my colleagues up here, but I don't know that we've hit that. So right. that's the reason why I'm saying I'm open to it, and I, I want to just be able to say that we're at least trying to make a difference. Go, <laughs> Go ahead, Miss Johnson. I would also be like to say, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> we're not. I promise you that. I also would then like to say let's do something for the students who love music. Let's do something for those who are not getting adequate uh, support in the sporting. Bring the program forward and I will consider it. We're duplicating our school system. That's all yeah. I'm saying. And discussion closed on my part. Okay, very Thank good. Thank you. Um, did you have anything else? I, I do have one other thing and, and that I wanted to quick talk about because I'm gonna go to Mr. one Wilson. of the things that's come up at numerous budget meetings is your contingency um, in the budget, the city manor's contingency. And when I was reviewing the procedures to amend the budget, um, it says under types of budget amendments and adjustments, uh, type three, transfers from one department to another department, including from the city manager's contingency fund, require approval from the city manager. And that concerns me a little mm -hmm. um, because I feel like the city commission should be approving mm -hmm. those, not the city manager. Because and yeah. Direction is being offered to amend the policies accordingly. We talked a little bit about that during the current fiscal year proposed budget process, so that's forthcoming. When will, when forthcoming? We will next couple meetings or so. Okay. 
Very good. Well, you don't approve the budget policy. It's an administrative policy, but Mr. Moore will bring it um, to you I'll be updating by email you all. or his report so that you can see it. But he, we are working, Mr. Dunkley, Julie, and I are working on it to bring it before you. And I can tell you it's going to be very consistent with the charter. Okay, exactly. so basically the that. 65000 does that apply even when he's moving something? That's a different Marvel? issue. That's, that's a purchasing a, threshold. Okay. So we can reduce the purchasing threshold. He, the, 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 the thing about the contingency is that you've approved this amount. You mm -hmm. said you right. can use this amount as you see fit. Mm -hmm. If he's going to make a purchase of 65000 or greater, then obviously that's going to come before that. you. Mm -hmm. right. so smaller purchases or mm -hmm. you know personnel you things or things like bids. that that don't come before you, you've essentially given Mr. Moore the authority to utilize that money in ways that he deems fit. And it may not come before you. So the budget's been approved. You know, that may be something that you want to consider next budget cycle. Or we can amend. Right. Correct. Well, amend, amend to take it away or amend, amend on. Amend how, or you how, can, it, how, it, how we it gets, do it. Uh, how I, it gets I, approved. I approve. Um, I'm in favor well, why not of that. make it a city commission contingency so the money gets approved as it's moving? I mean, the problem isn't, and Mr. Dunkley and I had this conversation months ago. Money is moving a lot within the budget and it's not we're not apprised of those movements well, that's, that's going to change and that's going like, to change as a result because myself Mr. Dunkley Julia Lynn we've all been working collaboratively over the last few months to get to this place so we'll be finalizing that soon and we'll be updating you all accordingly okay. and as a result of that administrative policy respective authorizations will be brought back to the city commission and again we touched on this briefly orally during the proposed budget process that just concluded Okay, and the one last thing I would like to say is we had discussed multiple times the um, meetings with members of the community coming to you. You had a meeting with a member of the community, a lovely lady, but she was coming to you about something she could have been seeing Sam on. You had another meeting with another woman, a nice woman, but she's coming to you on something she could have seen Sam on. And I'm bringing this up because we gave you direction I think I'd like to do it again. I think your time should be better used utilizing the staff below you to have these meetings. And you should only be meeting with people if it's something that is requires that level of direction. That is what I do try to accomplish occasionally. I've had experiences in which an individual were not successful making contact with the director, whatever the case may be. But if it's a rare occasion. If they can't get the director and they're getting you, we have a bigger problem here. Well, it's not, it's not a large problem at all. It's infrequent. I have a problem because I don't think it's a good use of the taxpayer's time. And you and I have discussed this and I understand that. And I'm on numerous board. times. But I need to see that you're on board. So what happens is I have this discussion with you. And then what happens is the schedule changes and you don't see the meetings anymore. First, they went to initials. And then the meetings are like taken out. I just, we need, we have a lot to accomplish here. I have a lot of expectations and I need you to be working on the things that you as city manager are supposed to be working on, not taking meetings because Sam is out. And I'm, I'm trying to be respectful, but I want my fellow commissioners to agree with me on I this. I think we already did in the past. Well, I I, I would think it's an important, because I don't know if I remember a real consensus um, up here, just to let Mr. Moore know that that is not an expectation. I don't know if, you know, if, if you really feel like you have the support of us, um, whether someone's saying you should go meet with someone or you're pressuring you to meet with but you and I talk about it all the time. What do I say? 170. That's correct. 70,000, right? That's, what, that's my saying to him. When someone reaches out, it's one of 70,000 people almost, right? Right. And you got to just think that. And do, yeah. you, do you need to spend time with that one of 70,000? Because you're going to have 70,000 meetings, right? And you have a team of 1,000 people right, right. to work with you. That's a saying that him and I have. So I don't know if publicly, maybe all of us individually, but publicly, I think you have the support where if someone is coming to us complaining that they can't meet with you, that we're going to back you up. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? Because we want you focusing on bigger things. 100%. Okay. Got got much it. bigger things. Good. Thank you. Anything Thank else? You. No, I'm done. Okay, Thank I'm going to go to um, Commissioner Boylston because you've got the next discussion item. Yeah, I, I, I think this is pretty uh, pretty easy. Uh, the uh, the county mm -hmm. passed a, um, a tenant's rights protection. Um, I, I sent it to legal. Legal said that we could pass something very, very similar, if mm -hmm. not the exact same is thing, to make sure we're covered because it does only cover 
you know, outside of city realms, right? Um, I, actually, you know I mean? the, like the ordinance that they ended up passing, um, it could apply to the city if we, if it would only not apply if we opted out. Okay. So if the commission's direction, candidly, I would, I would clarify our ordinance just because, you know, people need to be able to see it, mm -hmm. not just understand that, you know, the city would have to opt out. But technically, the way that the county ordinance is written, we would have to opt out of, okay. of their regulation. So wait, we're is, automatically in unless we opt out. Exactly. Got it. But I would like direction to amend our code just to clarify that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. And that's it. Yes. Right. I didn't know that it. aspect. So. Um, and then I just have, I have um, Go right ahead. one item. I'll keep it short. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions in regards to architectural styles in our city. And I don't think there's like a big rush to this. I would be in favor of having a workshop. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's Q1, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand staff just got mm -hmm. over budget. We only have so many meetings left in the year. I'd love to understand, go back. I'd mm -hmm. like to understand how these seven or eight were chosen. I agree. Right? And then I'd like to know how often are they evaluated? Right. And, and what's what the really, what really makes sense? What makes sense and what's the makeup? Um, like I said, no rush, but I've never been up here five years. I've never talked about that. I know. I think it happened on at a t point in time where I was sitting on the commission. I don't know if you were, but I, I, I think it was Carrie. Yeah. And um, and then all of a sudden there was a, a, a several more that were added. And I'm not so sure that they really were in tune with what we were trying to achieve. To be, I think it needs to be revealed. I agree. Yeah. Uh, I'm, 100%, more about uh, uh, it. I'm with it. Commissioner and ladies and gentlemen, I like to propose an early part of the new year, so yeah. maybe February, somewhere in that neighborhood. Okay. Perfect. Because it's actually filling up already for January. Yeah, sounds fine. Yes, yes. That's all. Speaking of Wait, this. can I interject for one moment? I was having a conversation earlier with Anthea, and I spoke to Lynn about this. This workshop, you know when someone comes in front of us and then they want to present something to go through the process and they only need one vote? Sponsorship. Sponsorship. It it, right. Thank you. I, I argued for two in the beginning and okay. we need more because okay, I, I that's on my list so don't oh. take that away from me don't I won't you can have it oh, okay. go good then you've you got already, your you already had your so look Commissioner Johnson yes I do have a few items uh, don't worry about don't worry about it I can drive with my eyes closed uh, <laughs> I promise I week every once in a while <laughs> Too much. She, You're too much. She kid you not. <laughs> I do have a bit, so stop laughing. You're gonna make me laugh. Uh, cyber security. It you're up. Everybody should have gotten an invitation to complete the no before by 10:30-2022. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know if that's you were first ahead of me. Shame on me. Um, is it the, do you have a deadline for it? Obviously not, because I got away with not completing March's activities, which I just did, and I was appalled. I intended to present to each of you, and I'll do it. I, I still have it in my email. I'll send you the percentage of the people in the city who completed those no before uh, sessions. And unfortunately, city commissioners, I don't think, men mayor, I don't think we were a part of it, so we're guilty. Okay. And as good leaders, we don't want to do that. I want each of you to remember a little bit ago, just not even that long, maybe a year, the city of Riviera, Riviera, Riviera Beach was hijacked or hacked or whatever. And in today's news, it, it was reported that the airport's websites had been hacked. Mm -hmm. Now, somehow or another, they got into uh, these systems, and it's, it's awful. We're being hacked all over the state, all over the nation, um, and all it would take is, I think, a seriousness about it. Now, when I visited with IT to understand how errant I had been and apologize as best I could, and keeping in mind how we, one, two, three, four, four and one on the CRA, uh, five of us were involved in something, and I want to call it fishing. Mm -hmm. We were fished without my knowledge, 7.30 in the morning. My day started with a phone call from Commissioner uh, Brooks. Well, no, you didn't call me. He called me at 7.30. Oh, because, 
I well, no. And and Lynn didn't, you call Lynn. No. Uh, you didn't call me, thank you. But they said <laughs> we were able to intercept whatever it was, the fishing, but you got through. Now, had you clicked on that project that supposedly I was asking you to look into, who knows what would have happened, and we would have been guilty. So I, I ask each of you, and when I said, well, if no one does the, take, uh, perform this, go through the sessions, what is the alternative? And Jay said, well, maybe we can, or no, maybe it was um, one of your, your employees that said, maybe we should just put them on, not give them a raise or what. I said, no, let's fire them. You know why? Because if one of them click on something, open up the file, and the hacker then has our data, and they're asking us, us for $2 million in ransom, how serious are we if we don't do anything but just say, oh, it's okay. You don't have to take the no before. No, they don't. You are not those. And Jay, I don't know if you can tell us, just yell out a number, but we, in some instances, don't even get 95% participation, uh, Deputy Vice Mayor. We don't even get 75% participation. That is a very, we don't, if you don't think it's important, when it happens, just remember, we didn't take it seriously. Right. Because if it can happen to you and you're taking the courses, it can happen to anybody. Well, I didn't take them in March, and it wasn't me. I wasn't even involved in that. They used my profile. They changed the um, address mm -hmm. and sent it to you. Right. Okay. Mr. Moore wants to just pop in here. So what, do you, what did you have to say to add? So because... Ms. Johnson brought the concerns up working with the Department of Information Technology, et cetera, all of us. I took a look at the most recent level of participation, which was calculated back in April 2022, so six months ago, and it was at 87%. That's the highest ever, so we are working to elevate that to a higher threshold so that we can achieve and respond to those concerns accordingly. So there is a strategy, a mission underway to help us get to that place so that we can create that so in the meantime, when this 15% who have not taken the sessions, 13. open that file. Yes, ma'am. Please. What's going to happen? Right. And if that file is loaded with something that's going to kidnap and hold ransom, the city itself, they were deadlocked. They had no access to their systems. Yes, ma'am. Just imagine. That's the need to expand beyond 87% early, and we shall. But if we don't, if you don't get it, what is, what is, what is your, um, your, your fishing, your, not fishing, I don't want to use that word, what is your bait to get the 15, 13% to participate? That's the balance we need to strike. And that is prevalent in our minds so that we can work out direction and get to that place. We are basically making it mandatory. And to come up with a specific date, there's of course, uh, excuse me, bait, as you put it, we have to come up with strategies that would work legally, and that remains legally? a of a focus. Sure. If you don't put it into someone's uh, Or put it in our policy, human resources policy, policy whatever. Yeah. But just saying I'm not going to give them their raise, or I'm not going to, you can't stop someone from taking their vacation or whatever. I think we're not taking it seriously. When you can shut down an airport website, Delray Beach is small fish, but it's important to us. Yes, ma'am. But if I may clarify, we don't have our system function separate from the systems that control billing mm -hmm. and the like. Mm -hmm. So I, just so that Ms. Johnson isn't completely panicked, because I understand your concerns. It sounds frightening, but I think that it, it, it wouldn't create the problem. I don't know that you... Maybe a one-on-one? -on -one? No. Okay, I'd, yeah, I'd love to have that. Okay, that would be fabulous. Thank you, Jay. you have a better understanding of how that all connects. Am I wrong? They are connected. They are. Okay. Um, what made you think they weren't connected? 
We only have. I one would server. assume we would have. Well, no. Certain things are not connected where her they could fish into her email and have access to her everything. Her email was so. never compromised, but someone impersonated her account right. Right. and sent it to you. So right. they never got open into it. her account. Right. But that type of scam can grant someone access to your account. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a computer locally to our network, Get in. it can spread. Mm -hmm. Right. And it takes a virus that they'll say, well, we'll send you something to remove the virus if you give us $5 million. Give us cryptocurrency at $1.2 million. I believe that's what the city of Riviera Beach had to pay. And it's not because they're local, I use them, but it's happening throughout the state. We in the city of Delray Beach are not taking it seriously. You know, there is a house bill. We have bill. insurance for that? Pardon me? Do we have insurance for that? There, I believe risk management is working on cyber insurance right now. Perfect. Okay, well, I, I don't know that we're going to solve this tonight. I don't I think, think so either. I think, I think that um, you have directed, and I believe that the commission supports your direction to the city in order to be able to make this a higher priority than it is. We appreciate the work that you're doing to be able to keep us safe and that you are putting out these, these um, uh, programs for us to be able to learn better about what we should and shouldn't open. So I appreciate that, but I don't think that we're going to you know, do anything more than just to impress on yes. the city manager. I just would like to. I, 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 I saw you had a bunch of numbers. Are we going down your list? Well, I, I, I do want to add that there is a House bill that was passed mm -hmm. just this year that is going to mandate cybersecurity awareness training. Um, beginning in federal 2024. House. Federal yeah, so that's at the federal level, yes. So I'm anticipating if it's a requirement, then maybe there's going to be auditing as well. There you go. So um, I think we do need to have something in place. Uh, sure. You know, by then. And as far as the insurance goes, I'm sure if we don't have plans in place and these numbers that these 13% that aren't participating probably causes cause us to pay more in insurance than if it was 100% participation. Well, I mean, so. anybody can make a mistake even if you did do the, the work in, in advance. It just makes it. you think. It does. It's all I'm asking, right. just to have our employees buy into our program that we must be cautious. Agreed. And no, none of you opened that project or whatever it was that was supposed to be there. That's because you were cautious cognizant of it but uh that 13 mm. percent yeah and you all are our prime targets because you're out in the public of course you have a lot of information about you um so they use that to, right. to, to try to trick you into making you think it's a legitimate email got it very okay good. okay well, thank Moving you very on. much thank Jay. You i appreciate much, Jay. your support uh palm trail safety issue mm -hmm. i think each of you probably got the email um i cannot imagine being in a, well, I guess I can because 4th uh, Street is getting to be really just a throughway from uh, Spady to uh, Northwest 5th Avenue and then on to Lake Ida. It's in one way and come out the other. So we allow these things to be created, sometimes by the county. Uh, the city had nothing to do with that, but they use our roads and we have no voice in it. But the places where we do have control, I wish we would uh, not let these issues linger. Added to Palm Trail is Carver Park. And before Chief Sims um, retired, he was back and forth with them. And he said, well, it's your kids who are the violators. We're going to come out there, and I'm going to do it for a couple of days. And I'll guarantee you, if I were to write tickets, it would be. But no, not always. If it's them, then write them the ticket. If it's someone just coming through the neighborhood at 40, 50 miles an hour, write them the tickets. I don't know the speed bumps or the greatest and latest and whatever, but I guarantee you if we were to have traveling um, traffic officers writing tickets, you might have people not come through that neighborhood again, just in case you don't know if the traveling officers are there. And I don't know if this is going to create a problem where we need to hire additional uh, officers or not, but we cannot just allow our city to become through ways to avoid the traffic signals or whatever is going on. And I think it's something we've allowed to go on too long. 
Um, if I may just jump on the coattails of that, in at um, in Palm Trail area, I know that it seems to be the worst times are when the kids are being dropped off and when they're being picked up. That's basically when you have these cars zooming, maybe they're running late or whatever. So I, I think that just a little bit of police force over of there might actually make a difference. A couple of people getting pulled over, it could change the whole dynamic. Same thing with the area that you're in. I know Spady. that the cut through time yep. frame is when that is really happening. So, folks. And ladies and gentlemen, such is the direction. So I've been working closely with the Office of the Chief of Police in recent days to proceed in that regard. And I don't know what you're going to do with Carver Park. That's a long time simmering. And they don't write letters to all of us, unfortunately. Maybe we'll start having them do that and might get our attention. Thirdly, uh, the Director of Purchasing, Mr. Moore and I discussed uh, the need for such a department head. I've asked, and now I'm asking you, Mayor and Commissioners, what are your thoughts on it? We don't have to discuss it tonight, but I think that we really do need a separate purchasing department. Mr. Dunkley has enough on his plate, and the solution that Mr. Moore and supposedly Mr. Dunkley came up with, I just don't think does it. And sometimes also I like to see separate departments because you might be pressured to do something because you're report, uh, reporting to the same head and that is an auditing type organizational discussion but I think most cities that are well run have a separate purchasing department and I'd like to see us return to that. Mr. That's Moore, do we have a separate purchasing department or have we combined the two? As I reported in the April 15, 2022 information letter report, it is a now a function of the Department of Finance. Mm -hmm. So you have a contract administrator function now that did not exist prior. So that was part of the outcome because in the previous structure that did not exist. So purchasing departments are fairly commonplace in much larger organizations, much larger municipal settings in that what we have in place now, given the contract administrator role, the purchasing manager function, and all the other dynamics that intermingle with the Department of Finance, it's actually a best practice for communities this size. Commissioner Dunkley, you have a question? So we're not going to have a separate purchasing department? Well, we don't run the city. And the but can we make recommendations, at least maybe can. to look at it? And uh, it's best practice, but let's see what the others are doing in our neighborhood. We seem to like to copy what Boker and Boynton. And, and they're doing what we're else. doing, for the record. They are doing yes, what we're doing. Yes, they are. Okay. Yes, right, they so are. So you know what? It, it, will, it will come out in the wash. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, then we'll be back talking to you about it. Of okay. course. Thank Good. you. Thank you for your mm -hmm. um, time for that. That's why I'm here. Yes. La I have three more, believe it or not. <laughs> Late agendas. Is there any way, Mr. Moore, that we can have the final, final, final agendas before we have the city commission meeting? Yes, ma'am. I've had discussion with the Office of the City Clerk about the protocols. First of all, the seven day in advance, getting it all squared away and taken care of. So we need to tighten up in that regard and department directors are being asked to respond accordingly as well. So we are working to achieve that. As a matter of fact, your next meeting is one week from today, October 18th, 2022 workshop meeting. The agenda is actually published today. Workshop is pretty easy, but that's this seems easy. to be our problem, our headache. But if I may, ma'am, that's that begins the practice going forward. So October 18th, we should be squared away for October 25th and so forth. So we're working to tighten up in that regard so that we'll be consistent. And we weren't before. So yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Especially because I'm going to go to my item number five. Um, it started off Monday as item 6B. Then it became item 7G, and by the time we got to it, I completely yeah. forgot it that I K. didn't, it was a K? Yeah. I don't even, I, I looked at it, I thought it said G. But mm -hmm. this, is, this is just not the way to run the ship. Um, it's bad enough that we don't have enough time to actually go through it. How com uh, Deputy Vice Mayor Cassell does it, I don't know. I'm gonna have to get her to train me. I don't know if she stays up days and nights and travels during the day to get around to the various properties and do all the work that she does and still has a daughter and a husband anyway. Um, she wears a cape a, after A cape, okay, I want to see it. Wonder Woman. 
I tell you, you're wonderful. And I would appreciate it because I do my level best to be able to participate and in depth, et cetera. So the more time I have, if possible. And it also helps the citizens know what we're doing. This doesn't look very good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, late agendas. Uh, I did want to talk about 7G, 7K. You sure it was K? I don't know. I Thank you. It was K-1 for the architects? No, no, no. This was about the closing. It's Instead 7G, of emergency, the ratification, ratification of proclamation. Oh, oh the ratification. Yes. Um, I don't know if it's something we, I'll talk about in comments at another time, but I think we probably need to tighten up who makes the call, et cetera. Even though I know it's uh, the whoever's in charge, emergency or whatever else, but um, we cause problems when we close City Hall, and I thought we had gone through that mm -hmm. at another time, but here we are again. Um, I don't want to be a Monday morning, morning quarterback, quarterback okay. but um, this particular time, because when we do close City Hall, we create a situation where we're creating people who are non-essentials and people who are essentials. Then the non-essentials don't get paid because they have they have to take their leave. They have to take their vacation if they have any. They have to take their sick leave. Um, we create a problem. So this particular time, I don't think, Mr. Moore, you are probably, um, because you've not been on a coastal um, city for a while, I ask in an email if you would help me understand. Because I think there has been a record of Delray closing, decisions made, and the commission does not get a, an opportunity to review exactly what happened. I believe, and I don't know because I don't have the data, I'm hoping that Mr. Dunkley or someone is going to give it to me in some format or another. If we could go back maybe five, six years and see all of the hurricanes that came through, what we did, how much we spent, how much we were reimbursed. And I'm sure we're going to be shocked as to how much FEMA did not give mm -hmm. us. So um, we have to be more judicious as to the calls that we're making as to what we're doing as much as we can. Um, we pray that Hurricane Ian never comes our way, but we never know. So let's just be a little bit more cautious about the use of our, fun our funds. Last but not least, there's a growing concern about the current most popular sport. Need I tell you what it is? Pickleball. Pickleball. I uh, have a discussion often with uh, various proponents of it, and they always come up with ideas. The latest idea is that there are two unused tennis courts over at Catherine Strong, mm -hmm. and perhaps they, those two could be turned into 12 pickleball courts. I don't, think you're I don't know. I'm not a pickleball expert, but I don't think that the right emphasis has been placed. We've had people come to the podium. I have yet to have Mr. Moore respond. If he's responding, I don't get the input as, of the response. So I don't know if we can do a workshop or talk about it. Just what are we doing with this popular sport that we don't want to be last or least in accommodating what the citizens who pay our taxes would like to have? Obviously, it's not tennis. If there are two tennis courts, that are not being utilized at right, one I'm of our parks. I'm going to pick that up afterwards, but I'm going to go to, if you're finished. I'm finished. Uh, Thank I'm you very go much. To, uh, uh, the vice mayor. Thank you. Uh, Lynn, we all got this email about the Palm Trail input, about the Hyundai dealership relocation. Is there any updates on that? It was sent to us about a month ago. Litigation? Yes. Um, so we did receive a petition for writ of cert. I think I forwarded that to you. Basically, um, it's a petition that's brought before the court um, alleging that they were denied due process, among other allegations. Um, we have not been required to um, file a response. A writ of cert is different than a complaint. It goes to the court. The court determines if there's legal sufficiency. If there's legal sufficiency, they would issue an order to show a cause to the city. The applicant, um, their attorney did contact me um, and um, offered to stay the proceedings. Um, if the commission had any appetite to potentially um, consider resolving this matter candidly in reading this, um, if they are accurate, 
um, and we should have treated that proceeding as a quasi-judicial proceeding because of the size of the property, um, then I would agree that we should just give them a redo. So when a court determines a petition for writ of certiorari, if I have to respond, I respond, then the court decides if the, um, if the city afforded due process. If we did, it ends and your decision stands. If we didn't, it would be brought back down for almost like a redo. So the court will never grant the rezoning. That's not their purview. What they would determine is if whether or not the city would have to redo the proceedings and then issue that to us. So at this point, um, I don't have an issue saying that um, it should have been treated quasi-judicial and that we should give them a redo. Um, based on the size of the property, um, rezonings can be treated two ways. They can be treated as a quasi-judicial or they can be treated as legislative. We treat it as legislative solely based on my advice. Um, and really the only real difference is that the witnesses would have been sworn in and that um, the applicant would have been afforded rebuttal. That's really the, or, or cross-examination. Short of that, um, you know, there are other allegations in here that the commission didn't rely on competent substantial evidence or things like that. I'm not going to weigh in on that publicly, but if you agree that, you know, I m made a mistake and that we should just afford them um, a quasi-judicial proceeding, candidly, we would have to do two quasi-judicial proceedings. Um, the first and second reading would have to be treated as quasi-judicial, and then, um, you know, you could still make the same considerations, you know. I don't want to say that much. Um, you know, I don't typically talk about these things publicly. We have shade meetings, but I do feel that in my preliminary review with the uh, of the petition, that I do feel that I probably should have told you this was quasi-judicial. So let me ask a question just on that. You just basically said that the courts would then tell us that we have to go back and, and redo it if, in fact, they felt like we should have. What's the difference in allowing just the courts to make that decision? Um, time and money. Time and money for whom? Well, time for the city, um, time for my staff to work on a response, time, you know, I would handle this in-house. I can tell you I'm not mm -hmm. going to farm this out to outside counsel. Mm -hmm. I think we could handle it in-house. But it, I would, you know, we'd have to, the court is going to require us to respond. I can tell you that right now. This is legally sufficient. You know, they meet the four corners of the requirements of, of a petition for writ of cert. They're going to require us to respond. How a court's going to rule, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at first blush, you know, I, and without, with doing very minimal research, you know, when I saw that allegation in the, in the petition, you know, I'm not going to, I fall on the sword. And if, and you know me, if I feel that I did something wrong, I'm going to tell you I did something wrong. At my first initial blush, you know, I don't agree with any of the other. I, I think that you were within the bounds of your decision making. I do think that you relied on competent, substantial evidence. But if I should have let the applicant have cross-examination and rebuttal and made sure that the witnesses were sworn and I didn't tell you to do that, I'm going to fall on the sword and I'm going to tell you, you know what, do a redo. Mm -hmm. Would you, know? you like us to just do a redo? I mean, I thought the witnesses were sworn in that night as my they recollection. Not. The they two were not. And the mayor even asked me and I said no. So, okay. you know. It's two. We'd have to do well, two. Oh, only. oh, both pre they have to do both presentations? You know what? I would feel more comfortable doing two only because we do have party opponents, the town of Gulfstream, right. um, who are affected parties, that if we don't do the two readings, they have the ability to come to court and contest it, and then we're back in the same boat. Mm. But so, my question is I, this. I, I'm in, I would just say that I'm, I'm in favor of that. I know I'll do that, like too. I know it's a waste of time, but right. at least it's not risking any type of I'm, I'm not saying that your decision was flawed. No. Right. I'm saying no, that no. I gave you wrong advice. No, no. But question, typically on a first reading, if we all were, if, if, if you say no, say the decision was the same as last time, you would have the second regardless? In the circumstances, the you're saying The problem is, is that you have an affected party that's coming in to challenge it. And as an affected party in a quasi-judicial proceeding, they do have the right to make public comment and bring that to you. And it might affect your decision as to whether or not it's going to move to second reading. That's the problem. Okay. Initially, my, my offer to settle, you know, if the commission were to approve it, would have been, fine, we'll redo second, second reading. You know, we'll give you another bite at the apple, and we'll, we'll see how the commission decides. In, in retrospect, and in deciding that there is an effective party that is quite vocal, and I do expect them to come back, 
I, I think that just to make a very clean record, I think we do them both at the same, we do a first and second reading. Look, if you have a quasi-judicial at first reading and you feel that you know there's competent substantial evidence that the rezoning is not compatible and not appropriate and it dies, then it dies there. You okay. don't have to do a second reading. Right, that's what but, I thought. You know, I, I really feel that um, it, I, I took a look at it today, and I don't think that your decision is flawed, and I don't. I want the record to be very clear. I think that the five of you made your record, made your bases known. I think the flaw is in my advice to you, and I'm falling on the sword, and I'm saying I think the applicant should have another bite at the apple. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. No. Sad as it makes me because it's a very long yeah, proceeding gonna, and it was a very long presentation and I apologize. That's you're going to have to turn in your cape. Don't. You just, you just say that again. You're going to have to turn in your cape. You know, you may keep the crown, but you have to turn in your cape. Thank you. You're, you're I, 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 I'm very candid with you. I think you, you have the. We yeah. appreciate it. So um, this will come back to you October 25th, and they will dismiss the litigation. All right, sounds good. Um, Thank you. I think you have your your. <clears throat> Consensus. Um, back to um, one of the things that uh, um, Commissioner uh, Johnson just mentioned about the um, pickleball courts over at uh, Catherine Strong. Um, I think that it's an easy thing to do. I think we can do it. We've got $100,000, I believe, came from the state um, for Catherine Strong Park. I know that there was a uh, uh, something we were going to put above the yeah, the cover or something like that mm -hmm. over the shade structure. But do we normally do shade structures above water parks? Typically not. Generally I mean, speaking, no. Yeah. So to me, I'd rather <coughs> see it go. the playground or the water park? It was above the water park, which doesn't make any sense to me. Because usually that's when you're in the sun. You're I in the water in the sun. I thought it was the basketball court. All right, whatever. Anyway, regardless, I'm just telling you that I, I'm okay with going forward and going ahead and making some solid park uh, pick a pickleball courts over there. Those are tennis courts that are not being used. They're too slippery. They need to be resurfaced anyway. Let's just dedicate them. I Is mean, we'll be able to get for this? consensus, please. I, I'm good. Um, we're. we're so the consensus is to take hundred thousand dollars. No, away. not a hundred thousand. No, 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 it's no, not going to no. take anywhere near that. Just oh, okay, convert I, it. You threw that number out. It's, it's no, no. There. we have that okay. for for that park. So let's use some of it to just deliver this. It, it's saying they would have to be resurfaced anyway. So in the resurfacing, they just paint there, the lines it, it's differently very, very and slick out put up two yeah, I just it. you threw me off with hundred thousand dollars. I'm, no, I'm just saying that. that there's already money there for this. So if the why cost not? is greater than sixty-five thousand, it'll come before you. Yeah, exactly. It shouldn't be. It's just resurfacing and right. putting some. Okay. Um, I don't know if you guys got it, but we got a holiday, not a holiday, Sorry. but an awards banquet um, instead of a holiday party coming up. I saw that. Can we sponsor staff? I mean, can I? Can we why sponsor a, staff? A, why are we doing an awards banquet on a holiday? See, see here's the deal. When everybody's coming together on a, on a holiday party, I'm talking to you, so I want your attention. Um, yes, when everybody's coming together on a holiday for a holiday party, we don't want awards because that's like now you're kind of sitting there waiting for awards to happen this is just a time to everybody let go and enjoy it's not like you know and by the way one person and a guest is all you can bring what about people who want to bring their family in for an award that's not the it's not the place for it and so we, have awards all during the year? we do yes, so we to do. me I, I when i was mentioning this way back in in february and i just saw this i was kind of like shocked that now we've become an award banquet instead of a holiday party I want the holiday party because I, I think it's too. what the people deserve, and I think it really does lighten the air, and it's just a place to come and really kind of let uh, let unwind. Could I add to that? Do yeah. we, I mean there was a charge to the employees, and then That's a charge typical. for their guests? Is it? It is. Every every year we do have that for um, because it it is supplemented by some of the money I think from the city, but I think that it was always just a a certain amount that comes in now. Okay, I'll take an employee with me as my plus one. <laughs> And I understand it was also just to That'd make sure idea. that was a commitment. I'm totally serious. I'm and I think it was also just to make sure there was a commitment, not to say you're going to come you go. and not show up, and then we it's, still it's owe them. Bucks. It's not crazy it's, amount of money. It's, anyway. it's just a commitment. You have skin in, skin in the game, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, so holiday party this. Is that everybody square in that regard? Because it's set for December yeah. 17th, Saturday yeah, at no, the golf no, course. No, no um, award banquet. I, I think that that just is going to change the whole feel of it. All right, so um, we were talking about the workshop and bringing in and having us sponsor 
it, it, it's kind of a weird thing. And I think that you guys had said, hey, about, how about two? Right, or three. Here, here's my thoughts. If we don't have three interested in anything going forward, why are we allowing one person to be able to carry something forward? To me, Precisely. one person sponsors to get it on a workshop, and three have to consent, not necessarily approve because we don't have the ability to be able to vote during workshops, but consent to it moving forward. That makes more sense. Okay, Can we do that? No, no, wait. You still have the employees working to, for the, on the workshop, oh, though. No, no, no. Okay. It just comes You're in. saying just have them come and do they, their own presentation? They come in. They come in with their and idea. And we'll do it at three. You have to have a sponsor to come in. Okay. okay. And, and then three. Got it. I have, to have yeah. three yeses to go forward. I, I it makes sense. I was arguing that from the beginning. It's a okay. waste of valuable I mean, it just time. just makes sense for I the agree. people. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. There you go. Okay. Done. So do you want an LDR change? <laughs> you can change that. Yes. All right. So um, you just changed it to one. <laughs> okay. Signage at Old School Square. We talked about this. Pardon our dust. Explaining what's going on. I think it's important. We have not. We, we were waiting to kind of figure out if we were going to have, um, you know, the um, uh, DDA go forward. We have that. Listen, I would rather not us make that decision. I want to put that in the hands of, of the DDA. They will put something cute, sweet, funny out there that makes sense for us. And, and, and that way we're explaining that we're in the process of, of you know, um, doing something. And so if you can bring it back before us and kind of think about that, I, I'm okay with that. I just Could would I like to, I'd to, like to at least have some sort of an explanation because we're getting all these billboards of why, why is it dark? It's, you know because of how it was left, okay? And we're trying to get through this process. So keep banging us, you know, right. it's okay. We're gonna get there. And um, so I just need to get something out there to explain to people on our grounds why it's dark. Speaking of- Could I add to that if you don't mind? Oh my gosh. I'm so sorry. Mine is important though. Go ahead. Of course. I, I was speaking to, no, no, I mean, because I'll, I, it's important to the out. subject matter. Yeah. I was um, speaking with a gentleman who indicated that he's going on Old School Square's website and not seeing anything. Everybody doesn't know what's going I on. Know. So whatever sign that we have, perhaps we can direct people or to. Or have one of those little, whatever those things QR are called, QR codes. Something. So that it gets it to us. Right. Thank you very much. Com Commissioner or, Johnson. Yes, I, it was more important. I will agree with you on that. Thank because you. Because that was not my, whatever. I just wanted to encourage Laura to not wait until our 20th meeting and not wait. Whenever we meet again, I don't know, can we make an exception if she has something by next Tuesday? Just come up with something and we, 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 we'll find the money to get that up, okay? So we're gonna do a retroactive approval? Because I, Whoa. Laura. No, 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 no. Laura's very excited oh, no, and she's no, ready no. to jump on board, but I no, told no. her I needed that an just ILA. Gets, so. That just gives her one well, this week. Is just, this is just a sign. I, I, okay. City and I'm just on this. Agency. And I'm just saying, she'll come. If we make an exception, it can be a part of the workshop. She'll come and she'll talk about it. it. We can't vote at the workshop. I know what you're saying. You're giving the direction. We'll move forward. But we just have to be mindful that she doesn't have an agreement yet. That's Correct. what the workshop exactly. is going to do. But I think that she'll come up with something uh, much more, you know, kind of like hip and. and As the DDA dedicated. director? You, you know don't think we're hip and cool over here? <laughs> Listen, I'm, I'm just putting in the hands that I think will make it funny <laughs> and. and and, and now the pressure's on. And All it, right. it's through the DDA. It's, yeah. it's got nothing to do with the That's correct. MOU or you whatever got it. So, we're going to do. All right. So finally, also the, on the same level, I want you to guys to know that I've looked at the sites. And when you go on to Old School Square, um, because they have all the names, uh, it, it still even has that it's 51 North Swinton Avenue. Mm -hmm. And this is in raising funds, okay? So this is not looking r like it should. And I have to tell you, there is a lot of mixing up um, of going on here. So I want, you know, Lynn to kind of check into what is legal, what's not, what can we do in order to be able to make it so that it's much, much closer. And they need to re remove our address, remove the pictures. I mean, they're not at the, the square. The pictures, I think they can keep up. I do agree that the address should be updated, and you know, well, I'll do the research and get back to you. Okay, sounds good. And um, whatever it should just be updated to whatever is on Sunbiz. Agreed. Okay, and so I don't know what our our um, policy is, but I got some complaints from the community. Um, there was a cookout that was planned at uh, Catherine Strong, and they were clearing out people and saying that they had rented the whole, you know, uh, Catherine Strong Park, which I don't think anybody rents an entire park. 
Um, we did have police, a fire, trucks, and all of that there. I just want to know what's our role in that, because uh, if we don't have a policy, and I'm not trying to like rain on anybody's parade, but what's happening is, is I'm getting calls about who paid for that and why. How come I don't have it coming to my, my neighborhood? And, you know, running off people off of uh, courts and things like that, not cool. But I, so. I've had the, um, the fire department will come to your house for a child's birthday if they don't have a call. You can call and schedule. It's free of charge, I believe. It's well, cheap. I think this is a little bit different. Oh. Yeah, this was a big, huge thing where it was a, it was a festival, kind of. Not a festival, but it was a cookout or whatever. And I, I, I get it. Listen, I'm not trying to, like I said, rain on anybody's parade. But we need to have rules for this. Because if one group gets it and another can't have the same thing, it's creating a problem, mm -hmm. okay? So we got to have some sort of an understanding. It sounds like a special event. If, 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 you, if we're involving our resources, our police, our fire trucks, and, and, and if they don't run on process. air, we it's very expensive fuel. So I'm of the opinion that even we may be wanting to revisit this child birthday thing because it is not cheap to run those engines. Oh, now I'm gonna, I am All right, we got to so stop trouble. the meeting. Yeah, okay. So now, finally... I wanted to say thank you to Pastor Dawkins. He got up uh, Miss Birdie's happy birthday online. I just saw it uh, flash up, so that's great. But even just as important, we had a really important birthday this, this weekend, and that was Dolores. So make sure everybody yeah. says happy birthday happy to birthday Dolores. Dolores so I'm hoping she's watching. Happy birthday, Dolores. We love you. That's it. Anything else? Yeah. All right. Meeting adjourned. Good night, ladies.